Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to a Wednesday night, a, a Wednesday night of heavy metallurgy. Um, typically it's the album club, but we have a special guest tonight that couldn't make it on the normal Fridays, so we uh, made it a Wednesday night episode. Alan, good to see you, my friend. How are you? I'm doing all right, Marty. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. I'm still trying to get my uh, 2021 taxes done. I'm almost done, so I'm late. Uh, but uh, we're almost there, and now I can get back to hopefully not having to pay in a whole bunch of money. But um, if you're ready, we got a lot to talk about tonight, and we've got a do. very, very cool guest that we've been trying to get um, in for some time. He's been a friend of mine for over 20 years. Love the guy. And I'm just going to throw a little bit of info at you folks. Um, S. Craig Zoller, uh, he's an American film director, screenwriter, cinematographer, no novelist, comic book artist, animator, and musician. He has um, written seven novels, two graphic novels, three movies, Bone Tomahawk, Brawl in Cell Block 99, and Dragged Across Concrete. He's written screenplays for several other things as well. And he's also a fellow Metal Maniacs alumni. And um, it's a real pleasure to bring him on. Love this guy. That's Craig Zoller. Welcome to Heavy Metallurgy, my friend. Thank you very much. I'm I'm uh, I'm real happy to be here. I am a, a fan of the program, and uh, obviously Marty, I've known you for more than twenty years. And Alan, although we were just meeting, I, I you know we've we've interacted on online for for a number of years as well. Oh, and yeah. I, I just want to say I think what I think your show is great. I think the attitude of the people uh, who comment. It's, it's enjoyable. I like the healthy debate. So it's not just everything lines up and everyone's saying the same thing. And um, I just I, I just really enjoy your show. And sometimes when I'm working really, uh, really long hours, like I just finished writing my newest novel and uh, the last period of, of it, of, of revision is like, I wake up at 1.30 p.m. and I work until 4.30 a.m. every day. And that was three and a half months. And it's really nice to just pull on some um, some dudes talking about stuff uh, I enjoy. Uh, and, you, you know, your, your, pro your program is really good. So I'm, I'm glad you've got you found an audience and that you're having a good time doing it. And I, you know, I just really enjoy listening to it. You yeah, so that's, yeah, that's great to hear. And uh, yeah, we uh, it's worth repeating that. Yeah, we've always had a, a really good chat community. So it's always cool to see those folks and uh, glad some folks are tuning in tonight. I know a lot of folks are excited to see you finally join us because yeah, we've been uh, been working with Craig for quite a while to get a lineup, uh, a time slot and a topic. And I think we've got a good one for tonight. Yeah, and and uh, let me just let me comment. I'm a pretty bad multitasker, so I I see that things are going to pop up on the screen. Uh, I'm somebody, bringing them up. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, somebody said something nice about uh, the movies. Thank you, um, but uh, I, I have a lot of note going into this into this program. I've, I've done the appropriate homework, uh, and some of it I, there wasn't any homework at all. It's just revisiting stuff I've listened to many, many, many times. So uh, yeah, I I, I, I want to get into it, and I want to be uh, respectful because this is going to be a, a longer show, and this is not. Alan's preferred uh, day of the week for the longer show, so I'm I'm looking to just dive uh, dive into it. Um, I will I will just do a quick plug for three new things of mine that I have. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, two that have come out in the last year are uh, kind of since since doing Drag the Cross Concrete, I um, returned to my let's say my first artistic interest, which was illustration, and I went and did a comic book to see if I could do one. And so this thing, uh, let's see if I can get it so it catches the light. Here it is. Forbidden Surgeries of the Hideous Dr. Davinas. Uh, so I wrote I wrote this, drew it, inked it, lettered the whole thing. It's awesome. It's awesome. Th thank you. Um, and this was just kind of to see if I could do it. And it was uh, a lot of work, uh, but really, really enjoyable. And that came out last year, as did my sixth novel, which is The Slanted Gutter. And this is a crime piece. It certainly goes in some pretty nasty terrain, as as one might imagine. So I think fans of uh, my crime movies would enjoy this. Uh, you can find those on Amazon. And um, and then the upcoming thing I have, the shipments have been delayed uh, a couple of times, but it looks like uh, it looks like I know uh, shipments are delayed for sort of everything. Um, 
it it looks like uh, the new comic uh, graphic novel will be out in stores in mid-November and in uh, December online and sort of everywhere else. It just hits the comic stores first. And this is uh, Organisms from an Ancient Cosmos. Uh, I love hard science fiction, guys like Greg Egan, uh, Stephen Baxter, uh, Ted Chang, um, Arthur C. Clarke, and those sort of guys. So that's going in here. There's clearly some horror as well and comedy as that stuff's in almost everything I do, but this uh, more particle physics than there are, than is discussed in, in Bone Tomahawk. And my just interest in science really kind of comes out there. That was, that was 14 months of the pandemic um, yeah. working, working typically like nine, 10 hours a day on it. And I'm extremely proud of it. And Dark Horse Comics is putting it out and I've been reading them forever. So I'm mm -hmm. thrilled with that and pre-orders are up. So, that's it for my plugs. Let's uh, let's dive into uh, let's dive into Blind Guardian. I do want to interject here and say that um, you know typically we would have interviewed and gone a lot deeper in, but like I said, we got a lot to talk about tonight, and we want to get into it. We'll have Zoller back on again soon. We'll talk a little bit more at length about his movies. But if you do have questions and stuff for him, save them for the end. So then when we get everything all done, you know, if Alan wants to jump off and go to bed to get ready for work tomorrow. You know, we can leave the floor open for anybody that has questions and anybody that wants to purchase any of his available things. I put a links in the description to his um, page that gives you a bunch of information about upcoming things and mm -hmm. actual links to other novels and other things that are available. And also his uh, rate my music page where he's done over, what, 3,500 reviews. <laughs> a lot of reviews and I have a lot of lists from, you know, like favorite thrash albums, favorite noise albums, favorite you know, all the Kiss albums ranked, all of the King Diamond albums ranked, all the Beach Boys and Beach, Beach Boy adjacent albums ranked, <laughs> 40 Neil Young albums ranked. So there's a lot of variety on there. My, you know, my top whatever 80 soul albums. Uh, so it's sort of all over the place, but that, that's where my taste runs. There's a, clearly a lot of metal because, um, you know, that's that's at the root of it all. Yep. But uh, you guys ready? Let's get into this. I do have a brief history to read through. You want me to jump through that real quick? Go ahead. Um, Blind Guardian is a German power metal band formed under the name of Lucifer's Heritage in 1984 in Krefeld, West Germany. Uh, after several lineup changes, the band changed their name to Blind Guardian and released their debut, Battalions of Fear, in 1988. The majority of the music is composed by vocalist Hansi Kirsch and Andre Ulbrich. Uh, nine musicians have been a part of Blind Guardian since their inception. And um, I think we should just start off. We'll start with you, Craig. What was your, what got you into Blind Guardian? So um, I'm pretty, I, I haven't pulled out the issue and it would be hard to unearth, but I'm pretty sure it was Review of Metal Maniacs. And I'm pretty sure it was by Maycock of Nightfall on Middle Earth. And because mm. that's the first album I got. And I actually still have here so i got this at virgin megastore it was the most money i had ever paid for a cd uh, i think it was 30 dollars, and it was in the import section and it yep. is there's some there is some japanese insert that you can pull out so that's that's the edition i have that the the jewel box case is thicker uh than is typical and uh so i read that review again i think it was maycock and and I got this thing and I was extremely impressed. It was really accurately described. This was at a period before I could go listen to music online. Whatever internet access I had was limited and certainly too slow for me to um, for me to actually listen to music. And uh, and then from there I went and got the the back catalog um, uh, whenever I found them at like Bleaker Bob's and maybe. Uh, whatever was a place on St. Mark's. I live in New York. Uh, whatever's a place on St. Mark's that was upstairs. Generation at Records? Not. I, I might have gotten one at Generation Records, but there was one upstairs. It might have been called Sounds, and then there was another place called Lethal Records. But wherever I could find the rest of them, I I, I did. And um, uh, and then I also have a, just kind of another connection uh, with it that's you know that's just meaningful to me. Uh, the way I got hired for Metal Maniacs was I did a fanzine called The Ultimate Steel Dissector with incredibly long reviews that really no one in the world wants to read. I can't read them now. It's like a paragraph on each song. And, uh, and it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a mix of 
just all the stuff I was into. So it's like Nile, Kiss, Emperor, Twisted Sister, and Nightfall on Middle Earth was in there. And probably, you know, some review that was probably like 4,000 words or whatever. But um, oh, yeah. the thing that Jeff Wagner found at, um, I remember Kim's video. It wasn't, it wasn't there, but yes, I purchased a bunch of things. I got Crimson Glory at Kim's video. Okay. Um, and uh, so I, I, I reviewed that album at length with all these other things and this huge mix of, you know, Blue Oyster Cult, Mayhem, all over the box of Plagats. And, uh, and when Wagner read that fanzine, he reached out, he found my number uh, and reached out and called and hired me. So like there's, I just had that connection with it as well. Like this was sort of me learning more about um, heavy metal beyond Metallica, Megadeth, Iron Maiden, uh, Black Sabbath, Blue Oyster Cult. And I knew, I mean, I already knew at that time Morbid Angel and Carcass and some of them, but it was, it was me understanding that, oh, people are doing stuff with um, pitch singing and in a more traditional style, albeit faster elsewhere. So that that's my introduction with the band. And, you know, like Into the Storm, that's the first song I ever heard by them. That's a good introduction. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Alan? Uh, let's see. My introduction to them was almost certainly through Sentinel Steel magazine. It was a you know small fanzine run by uh, Dennis Golby out of New Jersey in the early and mid-90s. He eventually... Did a record label for a while. He still does a lot of online distro stuff, but he covered a lot of European power metal at a time when nobody gave a shit about European power metal in the United States. And, you know, he had talked very favorably about the band, but couldn't find any records by the band. Uh, so, yeah, me and one of my friends, eventually we just got desperate, you know, went to the local indie store, talked to the guy behind the counter who was really good at ordering stuff. And, you know, he dug around in his catalogs for a while. He's like, I can't really find anything here. And so my, my, uh, my buddy, Matt, was just finally just like, look, we know you can find it. If you need some time, it's no big deal. Find me a Blind Guardian CD. I don't care which one. Just get it, and I will pay you whatever it is. Uh, and the guy knew Matt was good for it. Took him a month, and he finally called up one day and said, I have a Blind Guardian CD for you here. It's 30 bucks. Um uh, and Matt and I walked down after genetics class one afternoon and picked it up. And it was somewhere far beyond. I uh, played it. We both instantly loved it. Matt ran it off on a cassette for me so I could play it nonstop for a long time also. And yeah, kind of went from there very slowly, you know, picking up an album here and an album there. I got one from Dennis. Uh, he got some copies of Battalions of Fear in a few months after that. So I got two copies, one for myself and one for Matt. Uh, you know, another six or eight months went by and found a couple of import CDs at a record show. And so, you know, slowly cobbled things together there through you know, the mid and late 90s when this stuff just wasn't available in the U.S. Um, for up through... You know, Nightfall on Middle Earth, it wouldn't have been unusual for me to cite Blind Guardian as probably my favorite heavy metal band. Now, you know, that's changed over time with more releases and more bands coming and going and me hearing a lot more stuff. But uh, yeah, Blind Guardian ranks very, very high for me in the you know upper echelons of not just power metal, but all heavy metal. They've made some of my favorite albums of all time, and uh, we'll be talking about those here in just a little bit. But that was kind of my introduction to the band. Marty, how did you get into Blind Guardian? It was, I remember Maycox Blind Guardian review. That was a big uh, heads up. And, you know, the album got, Nightfall and Middle Earth got a ton of press. And I was way into extreme, the extreme stuff at that point. But I ended up buying it. And I don't have much backstory on it other than putting it on and being kind of like befuddled by it. I didn't. It just seemed so complex and uh, flamboyant and just over the top grandiose. It just all the big words, you know, it, it just, I'm, I wanted bedroom black metal with a drum machine at that time. That's kind of where I was at. And I just kind of shelved it. I'm like, Oh, you know, this is good. It's talented. It's it not was, cult enough for me. It's not cult enough. There's too many. They know, they know scales. It's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but um so i uh shelved it came back to it eventually and when i was in more of a power metal state of mind and it really it, it clicked and that was that was my first uh soiree into this band's catalog and of course we're going to get into the the nitty-gritty of it here but um yeah 
But let's get started. Um, Craig, we're going to start with you. You're the guest. You go first. Um, get going with uh, yeah. our oh, first and, uh, in the yeah. catalog. Yep. Yeah, right here. Just so folks know, we are, we're going to work our way chronologically through this stuff. And yep. uh, we'll tell you how we rank the albums as we go. But yeah, rather than just you know starting at you know number 12 and working up, we decided that, uh, yeah, we'd work uh, through from the beginning, talk about each album, and then uh, let you all know where we rank them. Okay. 1988's Battalions of Fear. So, yeah, I, I mean, clearly I was oblivious of music like this existing in 1988. Like, you know, I, I, I was very excited about Seven Sun. You know, it was, this was prior to the crushing disappointment of No Prayer for the Dark. That would soon <laughs> depress me for a matter of months. Fear, for, uh, fear of the Duck. Yeah, well, Fear of the Duck better than No Prayer for the Dying. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For me by, by a you know, by a gigantic margin. Um, so Battalions of Fear, I got later. As I said, I started with Nightfall and Middle Earth. So I, I'm not going to say we. Uh, I, I started with them at their most elaborate, but certainly I started with them extremely elaborate with the Kiss, uh, not the Kiss, the the, uh, the Queen influence, extremely strong, um, in, in an incredible amount of overdubs, already kind of getting into the zone where... Um, the music is sort of warring for space in terms of like the amount of elements going in, you're starting to lose some of the, the core elements. So that's where Nightfall Middle Earth um, landed. And so I got Battalions of Fear and this, uh, this isn't the copy that I got way back when, cause it's an album I've actually gotten rid of. And I, I um, just started exploring the band again uh, and at a certain point decided I wanted to have the, the entire catalog. So I don't think, I don't think very highly of the album. Uh, and just to give you my, my perspective in general, I'm more of a heavy metal guy than a power metal guy. I just think the riffs tend to be better. And that's some of what I like about heavy metal. You know, a lot of what I like about heavy metal is that the riffs are as important as the singing. And I think when you start moving into the power metal direction, um, the, the vocals start to become more important, like a Sabaton, uh, this band, for the, for the most part, like, you know, like take, you know, even my favorite albums by Blind Guardian or say like, a, you know, a Gamma Ray or whatever, like take those riffs and put them against the riffs on the first two Destruction albums or the riffs mm -hmm. of the first four Metallica albums. I just don't, I, I just don't find them as compelling to stand on their own. But I'm a, you know, I'm a huge Man of War fan and Man of War is along these lines in terms of the the riffs are generating a lot of rhythm. And so for, for Battalions of Fear, to me, it, it, it doesn't start out well. You get Majesty at the beginning, and I find this song just tedious. I think the chorus itself, the Majesty, what have you done? It sounds like he's exhausted the first time he's singing it. And then by the time you get there, like five and a half minutes in, um, the band just sounds exhausted. And, and I say this as a, as a sloppy drummer, recognizing um, that, that like someone like, what's his name? Is it Tom and Stouch? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that, or Stouch, Stouch. That, that's someone like, like this is a phenomenal player, but I'm going to assume, and I could be wrong, that this was recorded live in the studio in terms of the drum track. He might have been punching in. I could be completely wrong, but this is an incredibly precise player. And by around like four or five minutes, he's starting to, the accents aren't as tight as they will later be with this band. They might've just had less time to do it. But it sort of sounds like the eighth or ninth tank, the eighth or ninth ninth take of a very challenging song to play. So I, I just oh, I just find it tedious. So it's not a good way to open up the album for me. Uh, Guardians of the Blind, I, I that refrain just bugs me. So we're kind of we're kind of starting with that sort of thing, uh, and then you get Trial by uh, by the Archon Archon. Um, which is which is which is fine. There's like there's a little bit of Ides of March in there. There's a little bit of Don't Break the Circle by Demon in there, um, which I think they later covered. Uh, they did, yep. yep. That's fine. Uh, and then you get to Wizard's Crown, which clearly should just be called Halloween. Uh, and that's <laughs> that song is good. And it's if I'm going to listen to speed metal, which I tend to like less than power metal, you know, there are exceptions. I love that Savage Grace, Master of Disguise is great. The, the Running Wild, what is it, Return to Purgatory? That thing is great. The hi the scanner hypertrace. There are some really good albums I would classify as speed metal, but I definitely like power metal more than speed metal. But Wizard's Crown is speed metal done really well. Like the 
the when it sort of just drops into the Halloween, when it drops into that refrain and you're getting the syncopation, he's, they're giving you something really memorable. That song is also, what is it, 348 as opposed to Majesty 728. So it's just not it's just not grinding my skull into oblivion with relentless chugging and like whack-a-mole beat. Um, so run, run for the Night I also enjoy. So like right there, it's like, oh, okay. Like th it's, it's the reason why I was like, I, I should probably have this album even though I don't love it. Uh, the Martyr, um, it seems like, uh, again, this to me is another one where it seems to indicate they didn't have a lot of studio time um, because Hansi, Hansi Kirsch, who's, who I think of someone as having incredibly good pitch, there's some there's some pitchy stuff. He's in pitchy. Album. He's pitchy on it's it. Pretty pitchy on that one. Um, Battalions of Fear is okay. I think Battalions of Fear is 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 a tune where I'm hearing some of that like six eight uh, Transylvania, like the Iron Maiden Transylvania instrumental. Like I'm hearing some of that stuff come in, and and there's like there's a really nice twin guitar melody that comes in around the three three minute mark. But but I don't uh, but I don't love it. Um, then you go to um, by the gates, which I, I suppose is worth noting is um, um, you get the hi ho hi ho we're off to work we go <laughs> aggression. So for 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 two albums, this is the worst idea on a on a Blind Guardian album, but they, they do beat it on the third album. Um, and then you get, this, you get this Gandalf song, uh, which is sort of like an Ingve, you know, neoclassical back and forth with some nice enough solos um pretty active bass uh like that's and, and certainly very audible bass for this band awkward um, sounding bass i thought the bass sounds a little plunky but anyway yeah, it's not, it, yeah but it's but you could kind of you could kind of hear it coming through so oh, yeah um yeah and oh and yeah like and i mean they're they're experimenting like that that shit in guardians of the blind that like that synth erection the that thing that happens in there and we don't need that so, <laughs> so this album, as as one might assume, doesn't rate very highly for me uh, in their in their catalog. I put it at, I put it at number nine, um, but you know I'll put an asterisk next to my comment saying like I'm not like I, I probably have ten to fifteen albums in my collection that are speed metal that I really enjoy. Um, kind of depends on how much you do or don't consider gamma ray speed metal, um, and uh, so this is pretty committed to that. And I think less rhythmically interesting, uh, a lot of the a lot of whack-a-mole beat, um, and, and and again, like the Majesty just sets it off so badly for me because I find it tiring. But it sounds like they find it tiring. Like like Stout just like sort of like like missing some of the hits, and then that co the chorus concept itself just sounds like guys who are tired. So uh, so that album ranks ninth in the catalog for me, and my, my guess is you both like it more than i do um uh well yeah but yeah i don't i don't dislike it i think if if there's an equator of the equator is mediocre below it is in bad and, and above it is you know like decent it's i think it's decent um it's just there's no version of i would not have this album if this band didn't become much better right so that, that's that's my opinion on it all right alan you're up all right. So as I mentioned before, this was the first one I actually got to buy a physical copy of and was the second one I heard overall. So I admit, you know, it's got some sentimental connections to me. And as such, I've always ranked it uh, a little higher than a lot of other folks do. You know, Craig's criticisms are definitely fair for a lot of it. Um, one thing worth mentioning, too, because this will probably come up on and off all night different pressings and stuff for blind guardian albums tend to have slightly different track lists. There's different bonus tracks. So for example, some copies of battalions don't have the Gandalf's rebirth on it. Um, you get, you know, different uh, cover songs and stuff added to looking at the core album for battalions of fear. You get, you know, six kind of quote unquote, you know, full length songs and two instrumentals. So, you know, it's a pretty short to the point album. Uh, out of the six full-length tracks, there are four that I really like. Uh, I do like Majesty, but Craig is right. I it do. does go on too long. It does. Um, it's a good song. I like it overall. Um, it's not, it's far from perfect, but this is, you know, a band, you know, in the very kind of, you know, early 
stages. They're very young at this point. So good song, but yes, it could have they could have lopped two minutes off of it and it would have been a tighter song. Uh, really like Wizard's Crown. And yes, it was called Halloween back in their Lucifer's Heritage days. It's one of the few tracks from their demos, I think, that made it onto a Blind Guardian album. They just you know reworked it and for some reason changed the title of it. Uh, Run for the Night. Yep, that's a great track. And I like the closer Battalions of Fear. Battalions is also a little bit long, but yeah, it has some interesting twists and turns along the way. It's also a little weird in their catalog for having some you know, slightly political lyrics with you know references to uh, Ronald Reagan uh, and you know, the Star Wars uh, defense program and stuff. Not territory that Blind Guardian ever touched on very much. Where's the Star much Wars more of a band. I'm where, sorry, what? Where, where, where's the Star Wars reference? The 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 Ronald Reagan. I I, I didn't notice that. What song is that in? Uh, it's uh, the title track, Battalions of Fear. Uh, the chorus has a line. Let me pull it up here and make sure I get it right. They say something like, you know, because he's RR and uh, da, 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 wants to be a star. Da, 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 Armageddon. Da, 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 da. E -e -e close. Escape to do. Wait, I'm in the wrong song. Sorry about that. Which one did I pull up here? Uh, where's the chorus? Uh, Star Wars begin now. His bombs come exploding to bring back the deaths of the night. So yeah, there's some references to nuclear oh, uh, got it. going on there. And yeah, part of the chorus, which I'm just not finding. Is it the this one, I was just, yeah, that, that really seems atypical for this band to get into proper noun, yeah. contemporary yeah. world. Yeah, okay, it's here in the refrain that, yeah, you know, it's Battalions of Fear, the way of RR, RR being Ronald Reagan, to show okay. he is the star, Battalions. They, they failed it a little bit. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Yep. So uh, it doesn't bother me at all about the song. It's just, yeah, it's always stood out as a little bit unusual, but still a cool song. So, um, yeah, four tracks that I really enjoy. Two tracks that, yeah, are more average. You know, the instrumentals are okay, but I, I can take them or leave them. They're not something I'm going to latch onto. So for me, uh, I rank Battalions fifth in their catalog, which I do think is probably higher than most folks would. But like I said, I've got a sentimental attachment to it, and uh, it's a style of metal I very much enjoy. And four tracks out of six is pretty good, especially for a band rolling out their first full-length album with, uh, as Craig noted, you know, relatively limited resources in terms of you know time uh, to record and money to work with. So that's my take on Battalions. So, Marty, what do you think of this one? Um, for me, if I would have connected with this in the 80s when it came out, which I don't know how I missed it, I would have had maybe a different outlook on this album. Um, as it stands... Um, it's, I thought it was a solid, enthusiastic inception for the band. Um, majesty, you could tell they put their, their complex long song up front. Cause they're, you know, they thought they might've been a little bit fancy. Let, let's really sell this really cool. These, this cool <laughs> composition we have. I do like the song, but, um, I do love the fact that they've come out and said that, um, Halloween was a big inspiration for them early on. And you can tell, I mean, oh, they yeah. both started off as speed metal bands and evolved into something else. It's just halloween's debut the songwriting is far greater than this one this this is th them sounding a little disjointed and trying to you know find their bearings um but it makes the the sound the the the, the combination between speed metal and an iron maiden and some metallica riffage here and there it, it makes them sound very german which i like and the you know hansi's uh accent and the way he's singing it if if these guys were like the big brother to death row, I, I wouldn't I would be I wouldn't be surprised. They still, they have a very similar German sound for me. But um there's a lot of musical immaturity, it's evident, but uh I do like songs like Majesty and Guardian of the Blind, two that Zoller hated. Uh they hint at more complex ideas in a very in some very solid choruses. Hansi, solid performance, in spite of occasional clean singing inconsistencies. He's got great screams um very unique singing style uh with an unrealized talent below the per uh below the surface um a lot of instrumentals on this record kind of on it's like a band that doesn't have anything to say does an instrumental I, th those are kind of whatever for me um there's actually three trial by the archon i think is uh 
a lot of maiden riffs that's instrumental gates of moria and isn't gandalf's rebirth an instrumental or did i it is i just didn't mention because it's not on all editions of the album it's a yeah, bonus yeah. track on some yeah, three if i chop that the album gets a little bit better <laughs> <laughs> um i thought the album ended with a lack of vital closing it didn't have a closing statement the the, the album just kind of ends with a eh, you know they you can tell they kind of shot their wad up front trying to with the you know the long uh compositions but um for me this album ranks number seven it it could swim around here and there um out of 12 albums um it was a seven for me it's not the worst it's not the best it's just a little bit past the center for me but uh yeah that was 1988 let's get into 1989 with uh follow the blind here we are uh what one just slight slight correction i don't hate majesty i just find it tedious um it is this is i just just to clarify because and this is something that happens to me sometimes with writing with maniacs or wherever I nitpick stuff, and obviously you're talking about the stuff, particularly with a band that you like or that has so much potential, you wish was better. But, like, Majesty, I think, is an okay song. It's just I find it tedious, and there is a three-and-a-half-minute version of that with a with a couple higher notes in the chorus that I would enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a band generally operating at a level where the stuff that I don't like I think is average uh, rather than bad. There, I mean... Yeah, the hi ho, hi ho, off to work we go, and that stupid <laughs> organ beginning. That, that that shit is bad. But for the most part, Blind Guardian's worst stuff is just stuff that doesn't catch me, rather than is actively bad. I think that they are, um, you know, they're they're they put a lot of thought in the music they make, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would agree. I would agree, Craig. Even the stuff that I'm not that keen on. Looking at through these rankings and all this week, I don't know if there's anything I'd say. It's just you know really like bad or horrible outside of maybe some of their cover song choices but you know oh, bad their cover songs and i guess you get a little bit of a pass for that yeah but, um, i mean there's a novelty there's a novelty factor yeah like there there are there are out i you know i they have some albums that are pretty much at the equator for me or just above but i don't think that my least favorite albums that i don't dislike like mm -hmm. this is a band that to me is just there's just too much creativity and um and for the, and, and and I think Hansi is just a super talent. Like this is a this is a superhuman. Yep. Um, so yeah. follow the blind. I, I like follow the blind a tiny bit more um, than battalions of fear. But to me, it is more of the same. Just better done. Um, you get banished from from sanctuary. Kind of comes in and immediately you know like wow this band is tighter. Uh, the guitars are louder. Uh, and to me, this is a song that could have been on the first album. They've just now done it better. Um, and uh, but it, it's still not not quite landing what I think this band lands the best. And you know, I said like the power metal thing to me is a little bit more chorus and vocal oriented kind of heavy metal than say thrash or death metal or those things where you know I think riffs and vocals are even, and oftentimes the riffs are more important. Um, but Banish from Sanctuary, it, it moves. Um, you, st I, 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 and maybe there were some examples on the first album, but I think when I think of, um, Common Stouch, who I, who I think delivers in, on one of these albums, an absolutely historically great, uh, drum performance. This is the one where I feel you're starting to get a little bit more what he's doing, where he's, where you're getting, uh, where he plays and he's playing basically like a double time and then also doing, uh, sort of an alternation, like like you would find in 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 uh, thrash bands in terms of like the polka thing, except he's doing a rolling double bass over it, so it doesn't have the polka feel. And it's a way where he can kind of shift around, where he can keep the hammer going with the snare and either lock in with the hi hat or alternate with the hi hat to give it some momentum. Or sometimes he'll do he'll do these doubles uh, with it as well. Uh, he's he's a, he's a very very creative and innovative player. It's they're not all coming together at this point. But that, like, Banish from Sanctuary is a song where I'm hearing, like, oh, this is the guy who's delivering the performances on the other albums. Um, Damn for All Times, that's pretty much a thrash song. Like, I think if I've got to pick, like, their thrashiest moment, it's that. Um, this would be one of many Jesus Christ Superstar call-outs for these guys, um, as that's the, you know, the opening song after the overture from Jesus Christ Superstar. It's just, it's the music isn't there, but the song Damn for All Time is is the beginning of, of Jesus Christ Superstar and, and, and the best song uh, in that rock opera. And they quote that musically 
and lyrically in there. Not as much as they quote Uriah Heep and Queen, but it's up there. Jesus Christ Superstar comes up often for these guys. Um, Follow the Blind follows with, um, I like them going in a heavier direction. Uh, and this, this has it. I, and, 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 you know, Marty is a guitarist and my like music theory, music knowledge oh. is like sort of, is like more than a lay person, but I'm, 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 I'm certainly not, not an academic, but man, there's some harmony that comes in there that I do not like. It's kind of dissonant. I don't know if it's like, it's like a second or a fourth or what's going on there, but that mm. nah, 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 like I, and, and, and it's being reinforced by the bass. So I've just I, I don't like that choice. Um, I like the idea of them doing a heavier song, and I like parts of it, but that refrain just bugs me. Um, then you get two with Hall of the King and Fast to Madness are kind of similar to me, with um, uh, you know not quite as good as uh, as as though as as Halloween and uh, and Run for the Night, but here are two where it's like a lot of momentum, tightly delivered with with solid enough hooks. Um, uh, then you get Beyond the Ice, uh, which is fine. And, and again, like I think this is a band that's exceptional because, for the most part, um, because of the vocals and occasionally the 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 orchestration of, of different guitar parts. And you know this this is this is a pretty enjoyable tune that just has some nice lead melodies. And then you get to Valhalla, which I think is like, oh, this is a taste of things to come. Yeah. And I, there's a reason that this song. Is it, I mean, when I saw them live, which was with Wagner, it might have been Twist of the Myth tour. I'm not sure. It was around then. Um, I had a whole lot of pre-recorded backing Hansies, um, which is which which I'm happy when I saw recent footage of them playing, and he had three guys doing backing vocals. I'm like, that's how you should do it. They like, may have been. They're faking it, maybe. But yeah, they may have been doing backing vocals. <laughs> no, well, uh, no. What I saw looked like legitimate guys singing. They were. They were. He had. He had a band doing it. When I saw them, it was him. It was Hansi singing. Maybe Andre Ulbrich, and then it was just a million piped in Hansies, which yeah. you're stuff that can't quite be performed live because because of what it is. But yeah. they did Hala, and that's a deserving classic. Like that. That that song to me stands really above everything else on these first two albums. And that is a taste of um, the good pop sensibilities uh, that they have. And, you know, like this, what are the, I'm just, on uh, one of these things, oh yeah, this is this is the one that has their cover of Don't Break the Circle by Demon. Yeah, which, which is really good. That's a good cover. Really is better than any song on the actual album. Um, like, but I think Valhalla is close. Uh, and Hanzi, unlike the singer from Demon, who I have mixed feelings about, Hanzi doesn't at all sound like Meatloaf. <laughs> so here, this album is ranking eight, so slightly, uh, you know, a slight improvement over the first, and ending. And you know, Marty, you and, and I completely agree that the first album is sort of lacking any kind of conclusive statement. Whether it is Gandalf's rebirth or the other instrumental, it's kind of like what's what's happening at the end. And um, this one ends with Valhalla. And that that is that is a great statement. That is that's the that's the only hint on this that they could actually become what they became. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Those are my thoughts on the album. Uh, All Martin, right. Next or Alan? Alan. All right. Uh, this one for me, I actually like this one slightly less than Battalions. The two albums are laid out really similar. You, again, you get six full length original songs. Here you get an instrumental plus an intro uh, with the uh, you know, the little Gregorian chant Inquisition at the beginning, which is fun, but it's you know just an intro to set up um, Banish from Sanctuary. Uh, do you like Banish? It was in their live set for a very long time. Works very well live. Uh, fun song there, and you know, it's you know got the big chorus that you want to get people singing along to with. Um, but it doesn't go on as long as Majesty did. So, you know, they've got that reined in a little bit on the opener. The next four tracks, none of them are bad. None of them have ever really stood out as personal favorites. Um, so, again, it's just like, okay, we kind of have to chew through four tracks and the instrumental. And, yes, then you get to Valhalla and you have the big finale, which, yeah, it's, you know, the best track on the album. 
another one that's been a live staple for the band. It always, uh, you know, gets everybody singing and chanting forever and ever as they, they let that song drag a long time, sometimes playing it live, but the crowd has so much fun just chanting it over and over. Nobody minds. So it, it really shows that they can still be playing that song this far along in the career and people are still loving the chance to hear yep. it when they perform live. Yep. Um, so, and then it's over. You know, this album to me has always felt like uh, it's a lot like Battalions, but um, whereas Battalions has four songs that I really enjoy, this one's got, you know, two tracks that really stand out and four in the middle that are okay. They're not bad songs. It's just that, yeah, they don't really ever stick with me very long. In terms of covers, again, it depends on what, you know, edition you've got. Some copies, yeah, have the excellent Don't Break the Circle cover. They absolutely destroy that song. It sounds incredible. Better than Demon. Uh, and, and then the Demon version is fantastic. Demon can be hit or miss, yeah. uh, even on some of the early albums. But, you know, it is a classic song by Demon. But, yeah, having, you know, Hansi and company kind of take it and you know, put it through the German power speed metal processor, it, it works incredibly well. But then some editions also have the Barbara Ann cover, which takes everything good they did with the Demon cover and just brings it right back down to a net sum gain of zero. <laughs> Uh, again, it's a cover song. I'm not going to, you know, dock them tons of points, but I am going to have some fun at their expense because it's a horrible, horrible thing for them to do. I get German bands often have, you know, the, the quirky sense of humor when it comes to cover tracks. So, okay, if that's what you want to do, it is just a bonus track, and you did stick it there at the end of the album where it's very easy for me to skip and pretend it doesn't exist. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a bit rough. It's funny that possibly you have their best and worst covers, you know, right there back to back on the yeah. yeah, it's not their worst. It's damn it, close, but it's not their worst cover. There probably is uh, worst ones that I'm just blanking on, but we'll you know we'll oh, unearth those suppressed memories as we go through the evening here. I think Barbara Barbara Ann is the worst. I'm without it, it's that. it's damn close, but there's another one that really fucking makes me angry. Oh, anyway. I think I know what you're talking about. And what one? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, yeah, we'll yeah. I, I gotta guess as well. We'll get there. Uh, I want to need medication after this. Talk to my therapist. <laughs> But uh, so, yeah, for me, wrapping this one up, I've got Follow the Blind ranked seventh. So, you know, just below the 50% mark. Uh, again, not a bad album at all to me. I wonder if it, maybe it was a bit rushed coming out just a year after the debut. It, I don't think it has any of the demo tracks. So they were having to write all new material and crank it back out. And just, you know, the album's layout length, everything feels very similar to what they did on the first album. So I'm good. I I've always had the sense that maybe they didn't have much time to, you know, progress forward. It sounds tighter, you know, uh, maybe than battalions a little, you know, step up in the musicianship department, but it, it almost feels like they ran the album back. It's like, well, battalions seem to do okay. Let's just kind of follow that blueprint one more time and uh, get, get this album out, uh, out the door right away as fast as we can. So I'll rank it number seven this evening. All right, Marty, what's your take on Follow the Blind? All right. Uh, I think it's a slightly better production than uh, Battalions. Uh, again, it sounds very much a product of Germany from the 80s. I mean, it just sounds like a German band, which which is cool. I, li I like that. Hansi's vocals improve. He's more on key on the clean parts. Uh, he really sells the choruses on such classics as Banished from Sanctuary and Valhalla, which has Kai Hansen making a vocal appearance on there from Halloween. I will say, if you're a German band and you're playing this style of metal and you can't write a good catchy chorus, they instantly export you to Czech Republic. I don't know if you all knew that, but that's <laughs> that's actually a thing. They get them out of there. They don't want any of that muddying hey, up there. Marty, were you were you aware that when that that part when Kai Hansen enters that song? He is jumping off of a diving board. <laughs> Every time I hear it, it's just like, ah, it's like airborne. <laughs> it's like, can't recover. It just sounds yeah. like it's off of the diving board into that song. His vocal production on that is so out in front and awkward. It's like, it is. It's, it, but then he nails that like triumphant soar at the end. But yes, uh, uh, musically, I think the album's more advanced. It's more interesting, uh, more interesting musical shifts and even more acoustic guitar found on the title track uh the musical growth is instantly noticed and appreciated uh, it's a very solid second effort i will say 
you end a, you end your album with uh, Valhalla, which you know remains a classic to this day. It's a sign of Blind Guardian to come. But then you fuck. I mean, even I like the Don't Break the Circle. That is a good song. Um, that's the best song on that Demon album. Even Barbara Ann. I mean, you're coming off the best thing to do here. Granted, I've got like an expanded edition, which probably has like Japanese bonus tracks on. It. I don't know, but. Valhalla should have been the period at the end of the sentence. They should have ended the album there, not tagged on the fucking don't break the circle, even though I like that song, but then they completely shit in the Kool-Aid bowl with fucking Barbara Ann. It's just so, I mean, it, yes, them having fun. They do an okay job on it. I just, it's just so out of the metal realm to cover that song. I just, are they think they, they think they're being funny. I don't know, but Otherwise, that Sully is an otherwise solid record. I give it a, um, uh, Battalions was seven. I give this a six. It's a slight step up from Battalions. And uh, yeah, and that brings us to um, Tales from the Twilight World, 1990. Mr. Zoller, you are up. Here we are. Um, so this this is a, this is a phenomenal improvement. Over it's a huge the, step over, in progression for sure. I mean, let, let's. I mean, we just had the albums. I'm ranking ninth and eighth, and then here's the album. I'm ranking third. This is like a so far so good. So what? Rust in peace. Step up. It is gigantic, <laughs> and um and probably I, you know I, I I'm curious. Let me let me ask it. Like, it's still there's I I don't think it's a too big a stretch to say this is still speed metal. It's, like it's still they're clinging to it, but it's a little more mm -hmm. subdued. Obviously, I think there's the power metal stuff is coming in, but if you consider this a speed metal album, then outside of that scanner hypertrace um, thing and 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 um, somewhere out in space, there aren't many that are this good. If you still consider this, if it's a power metal album, that's a different discussion. To me, a lot more a lot more competition, but my, it is a it is a colossal improvement. So you get yeah. traveler in time. You know, this is also another Uriah Heap callback, so one of one of many. Uh, and something that I'm going to point out that they do better on this album and and the next one than later on in their career, and that is, I'm um, really diversifying the voices that are the backing voices. And it sounds, you know, like this is something where I think m like metal bands could take a lesson from the rock bands. Like this is where like you know Blind Guardian and a lot of these bands where they're just stacking the same singer with the same voice a million times and maybe singing a bunch of different pitches. Like, yeah, there's there's a reason that if you see the Eagles live or the Doobie Brothers or Chicago or whomever else, one of these bands where there are four, five, six, seven uh, people doing lead, lead vocals, that that harmony sounds especially rich. And it's, it's not because it's the same dude tracked 10 times. And I feel you're still getting that on, on Tales from the Twilight World. It still sounds like, other voices, and I'm, I, I know he's mixed in there, but it doesn't just sound like like it when there's a call and answer. It doesn't sound like Hansi's in front of a mirror, and um, so I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Traveler in Time is is really enjoyable. I really Very like, strong. and and this is and this is something like I, I I suppose this is this is a place where when I look at power metal and speed metal and 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 the reason I would rank like heavy metal, epic metal generally higher. Is is I like the space that you get in heavy metal and epic metal, and also like instrumental space where it isn't just jammed with vocals. Uh, and like the end of this song when it goes into the acoustic part, and then they have the twin guitar um, doing the traveler, the, having the the they're do they're taking the lead with the guitar that was the vocal melody, and then they're 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 translating it on the guitar over the acoustic stuff at the end, it's just beautiful. Like, and that's a, that's a sign of like, oh wow, they're they're really, they're really doing very, very cool stuff. And then you get Welcome to Dying is um really enjoyable. Like this Great is chorus. Really, yeah, like and 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 a and a chorus where the backing vocals kind of become the lead. And again, like that same thing where they're alternating, but it doesn't sound like like 25 Hansi Kirsch's in, you know, in some kind of clone chamber. And that sort of diversity in terms of sounds and voices is just great. And so that song obviously really is like, in terms of songs that have momentum and then build to that precipice and then have that hesitation to welcome to dying. And I remember, I just remember live, you just feel the rush every time, every time on that downbeat when that kicks in. It's great stuff. Um, 
Weird Dreams is a cool little sidebar. I'm not sure that it necessarily needs to be on the album, but you've got like kind of almost like thrash tech leads on it. It's it's a it's just a different sort of thing. And then you get Lord of the Rings, which is um, their first truly great chorus, in my opinion. Um, I like Valhalla. Valhalla is not uh, slow down and sail to the river. Like this is absolutely beautiful stuff. Oh, it's a good song. Yeah. And this is and this is something when. And, and this is something like found in in a lot of my favorite German heavy metal. Uh, and actually, uh, you know, whether it's like the Scorpions on Holiday or Coming Home or or a song like this, there's a there's a strength, but there's also a, like a really kind of forlorn quality. And it's just beautiful. And um, like you know, I, I I played that song for my girlfriend who doesn't really listen to, to heavy metal. And when it switches to that chorus, she said, "I got chills." And that's and it transcends. And this that's is when you swoop down like a condor. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't in seduction. Uh, uh, in, the lead, in the lead that goes in. That, that is not the bird noise that uh, should be invoked when one thinks of romance and amour, uh, Marty. It, it's just not. I'm sorry. It's, it's prey. Uh, bird of prey against. That, that's uh, the sound you hear right before one, uh, right before someone shits on your car right after you wash it. <laughs> anyway, uh, continue. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, please, please, please do. Uh, in the lead, so Andre uh, Andre Ulbrich, is that how we're saying his name, Andre Ulbrich? So this is obviously a really talented player. Uh, in 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 short, really talented player in general, making really happy choices. Too many leprechauns in that guy's life. And, oh, I love the leprechauns. I, and and um, to me, with that lead, that's essentially the bridge that takes you into that chorus, him wandering around. I don't think he has a better moment ever in, in throughout the history of this band. He has some other moments I would compare to that. But it is um, at, that's just a beautiful lead into that chorus. I would love an album of that. Uh, like, make an album of those. It's sort of like some of those, like, smaller tunes you get on older Jethro Tull albums between the big ones and uh except that except that Blind Guardian does it better uh so beautiful stuff um goodbye my friend I'll accept it it's this is a little bit like I feel I mean all these metal bands do this I feel Surgical Steel from Carcass was this where the bands need to prove the tough so they've just gone they've just gone to the They've just gone to slow down and, and uh, to the river, and now you're getting something <laughs> at the edge. You're getting something at the edge of thrash with "Goodbye, My Friend." I still like it. I mean, this album is this album is really consistent, but it's I mean, compared to "Lord of the Rings" and and "Welcome the Dying Traveler Time," this one a little bit forced for me. Um, oh, sorry, I made a mistake. This "Lost in the Twilight Hall." This is the one that has. Uh, isn't this the one that has the crazy Kai entrance? Or yeah, I, he's, yeah, mm -hmm. I believe so. This is the one where he comes in like, like in <laughs> that way. So, but like the or intro, a condor. <laughs> yeah, the, the intro to this song really like. I wish they did a little bit more of this stuff, like that sort of chuggy hooking up with all those accents. Really, really good song. And um, so at this point, you're dealing what? What is it? One, two, three, four, five, six songs. I like them all. I think Lord of the Rings is nearly great. Uh, Welcome to Dying is nearly great. But then we get Tommy Knockers, which which I really feel is the dud. And I really feel they they did. I was like, this is the moment that I think is worse than hi ho hi ho. It's off the work we go. Is the oh last night and the night before Tommy Knockers Tommy that that shit is horrible. <laughs> it is it is the worst idea on their on their first three. I'm probably the first, the worst idea for their first two decades. I, I just can't stand that idea. Um, and it just tanks that song. So that's the dud. Um, Altar 4, I'll accept, but feels a little bit forced as well. Um, and also, I, I, I maybe I've got the song wrong. There's a Merciful Fate riff in there. I think it's from Come to the Sabbath, but it might be from a different tune. Um, it's okay. I, I, think it's, I think it's decent, whereas Tommy Hawkins, I think, is one of their few legitimately bad songs, Altar 4, I'll, I'll, I'll accept. And then we're ending really, 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 really strong with The Last Candle, which is at least as good as Lord of the Rings. And to me, their other real like, oh, this 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 band is, this band can actually make great stuff. And that, I mean, 
that the uh, like the gang harmony in that, and just the, it's it's it and and the alternation of the um, uh, those voices coming in and the different qualities of like there's hope for everyone, like all of that sort of stuff. It's just fantastic. I mean, this is ah yeah. I mean, that's it's a great it's a great. Uh, conclusion to an album. It's my favorite song on the album. This is not a band that regularly ends on their on their best song. Like some bands, like I think Megadeth is pretty good at ending on really strong tunes. Like maybe more than half of their albums, one of the couple best songs is towards the, is is the closer. Uh, Bond Guardian is not that, but they did it here. Last Candle. Other than Lord of the Rings, I don't think there's competition for like what are the best songs they've done at this point in this career. So gigantic step up. Really powerful sound. Um, the singing is this is this is the singing because again, like my first experience with them was Nightfall on Middle Earth. So this sounds like the singer who's on Nightfall on Middle Earth coming up with that stuff, albeit holding on to the uh, speed metal and and a, an aggression that that was there. So um, yeah, as I said, this album I ranked third in their catalog, and I want to thank Alan um, for talking about this album because he's bringing the, he brought this one up many times, and this was one. Uh, up until recently, I'd sort of lumped in a little bit more with the first two because it still has that speed metal thing. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot more time after Alan had mentioned it a couple times on these shows. And at, at some point I was like, wow, this this is this is a really strong album. And you know, in particular Lord of the Rings Last Candle, if the rest of this album was was manure, I would have this album forever for those two. But most of the rest of the album is really good. But uh this is something we're definitely um, tuning in regularly to heavy, heavy metallurgy. Um, like it just, you know, you, you kept bringing it up and I was like, let me, let me spend a little bit more time with that one that I've lumped in with the other two. And it is, it is a gigantic step up from the other two. So, so thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Glad you, uh, glad you got into that one more. That's cool. All, All right. right. Well, for, uh, my take on this one, I'm going to echo a lot of what Craig I'll be right back. Just Go ahead. said. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, it still has, yeah, I think a lot of folks still consider it, you know, more of a speed metal album than anything else, and that's fair. But yes, you're starting to see the band diversify and try more different things and be very successful in those experiments. Um, the album starts out monstrous for me with Traveler in Time. I just, you know, the big buildup with them chanting, you know, the morning sun of Dune and, you know, mm -hmm. Having you, know, yeah, you know, the lyrical content, you know, based around Dune, uh, you know, it shows that, yeah, they're not just going to do, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, you know, sword and sorcery and wizard and castle songs, you know, here they're going off, you know, on you know, one of you know, the really gigantic, you know, science fantasy epics and putting it into a song form and it's just, you know, absolutely nailing it. Welcome to Dying. Yes, great follow up, um, really strong song. You, you've got, yeah, you know, Weird Dreams is instrumental. It at least you know, changes the pace a little bit rather than going right into, you know, a third barn burner of a track. Uh, then you have Lord of the Rings, which, yeah, you know, one of their first, you know, slower um, kind of experiments, which they obviously would do a lot in this time. But this is still one of the best uh, attempts they ever did at that style. It's an uh, amazing track, beautiful, fits perfectly right here. It lets you catch your breath, but in a really good way. It's a great song. And then you're kind of ready, yes, you know, to, uh, you know, get the tough back on and you jump back in with Goodbye, My Friend, um, which also, while it may not be the strongest song on the album, it is the point in the album where I think you want them to hit the gas again, that, you know, you had the instrumental break and they've had, you know, this really awesome, you know, beautiful kind of, you know, acoustic number. And it's like, okay, but now it is time to just, you know, fire up the double bass and just start blazing away again. And so Goodbye, My Friend is a good job, you know, getting you back up to speed. Lost in the Twilight Hall is another one. Yes, just, you know, the huge choruses uh, really define this album that, yes, it's not just Hansi and multi-tracking Hansi. It sounds huge. It's bombastic. They sounds like, you know, he's just got, you know, Legion behind him uh, singing this stuff. And then, yes, um, most great power speed albums have a weak link in the track list somewhere. And with this one, it's Tommy Knockers. It, there's 
I can't defend that song. I wouldn't even try to. It's very clunky at best, and that's putting it nicely. <laughs> Altar 4, it's 2 minutes and 27 seconds. It's there. It does its thing. It moves on. But yes, then yeah, they, they go out in a blaze of glory. The Last Candle is right up there among the best tracks on the album. Uh, it just leaves you breathless at the end. You want the album to keep going because they are nailing it so incredibly well. Um, some versions have a live bonus track for uh, Run to the Night, which is you know one of the better tracks from the earlier album. So hey, you can get a good bonus track here as a live track. It's a phenomenal album. It's, uh, well, I'm just, I'm going to rank it number one in the catalog tonight. It wow. isn't always okay. my number one. It's not always my number one. Uh, there are times I rank it maybe number two, but um, for tonight, it's going to take the top spot. So it's all downhill for the next, you know, two, <laughs> three hours, however long we have to talk. It's all down here from here, kids. Um, but yeah, it is. In the conversation for my favorite power speed metal album of all time, if you discount Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 1, if Keeper's 1 just doesn't exist for whatever reason, it's erased from the timeline, then uh, Tales um, might be, uh, yeah, the top of the heap for that entire genre. It's one of my all-time favorite albums in heavy metal period. And could, uh, yeah, can fight anything the side of Keepers Part 1 for spot number two on the power metal list. So, Marty, um, do, you, do you like it as much as I do? Uh, it's up there. <laughs> not Maybe not as much, but uh, it's up there. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Oh, yeah. What have you got on it? It's What's even it? more cohesive production with more focused and advanced song ideas. Changes within the songs demonstrate more of a flow. Some of the early stuff, those transitions are a little janky. You know, they kind of lock the shutter into place more vocal layers obviously in the choruses um add way more color and depth classic tracks traveler in time welcome to dying lord of the rings this song uh, is the first truly grandiose uh blind guardian song to me anyway almost a ballad uh, orchestration in their first conscious step into more mature and musically cultural fantasy world uh Again, Hansi's beginning to really realize some of his vocal gains here. Um, he's continuing to clean up his clean performance, and he really starts to push himself. He starts to live in the higher registers a little bit more here and there, which that's where I really like it. I like I like all facets of his vocal performance, but uh, when he's in the higher registers, kind of pushing it a little bit, that's where it really gets exciting for me. Least favorite song, Tommy Knockers and Altair 4. Both of these songs are just disjointed and uh, forced sounding to me. Well, all um, three of us did the same thing on that. Yeah, yeah. And for me, this is a number three. This is a number three in their catalog. It's a really solid album. I mean, other than, you know, Tommy Knockers and Altair 4, the, the quality so outweighs the um, the bad stuff that, you know, I can live through the bad stuff. It's not a big deal. I mean, the payoff is far greater than um, the negative strikes. But, yep, it's a solid record. Number three for me. Which brings us to their fourth album, 1992, Somewhere Far Beyond. So one thing, just uh, just um, a general thing, uh, in terms of Hansi, this this is an incredible singer, and obviously a lot of talking about this band is just talking about him. Yeah, um, I like his cleaner voice more. Um, he obviously can get ultra gritty, and um, and then he's getting in kind of like that Ronnie Atkins. Is that that's the Pretty Maids guy, right? Yep. Yep. He's getting in that Ronnie Atkins, Blackie Lawless. Like he's getting in that zone, and to me, he can overdo the evilness um, with with all of that grit and gravel and. Um, uh, but when he sings a little bit cleaner, I mean, his his highs are great. Obviously, he has a huge range and actually can go particularly deep, considering how high he can go. Uh, but uh, I, I like I like his voice. But I tend to like it. I mean, I like the shrieking. I like the I like the screaming. I like the singing. But but I think he he can on occasion, to my taste, just overdo the gravel evil, particularly for the context of the song. Yeah. Uh, just just talking about him generally speaking. Like I don't know. In terms of what other metal singers you get, what other metal singers you would compare him to? But I think Ronnie Atkins is probably the first one, and then maybe like Blackie Lawless. He just has that. Mm. There's a 
right that's there. That's a good call. That's a good call. And Blackie Lawless might have been a comparison in that ancient, you know, Metal Maniacs review 25 years ago because I've always had that association, but I think he reminds me a little bit more of Ronnie Atkins. So we get to um, uh, Somewhere Far Beyond, uh, which I really enjoy. Um, I prefer the previous album a little bit more uh, just in terms of its, of its consistency. Uh, this album, I'll point out the guitar tone is awesome. Like the guitars are roaring. This sounds like, I, I don't, I don't know who produced this. I probably should have looked this, this up, but the guitars are right. It's like, it, it, these are like yelling, kill them all guitars, but with more like a ride the lightning kind of compression going on. And, um, their, their guitars sound really good and really big. Um, uh, so going through this album, time, what is time? I enjoy it's not it to me. It is it's a special tune. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's one that I enjoy journey through the dark. I, I find the refrain a little bit forced there, but I enjoy it. And this is also a tune where they're ending. And this is something that this band doesn't do that much. Like they're landing with this really nice twin guitar melody at the end. I wish they'd milked it longer. And in general, that's something that I wish this band explored more were, our, our instrumental sections where there's really a lift, a riff or a melody leading you through into other parts. And I feel in general, the instrumental sections of this band are departures and rather than, rather than developments with like a different, like I feel a bunch of stuff happens and then you get back to the course and they might develop that more out where say something like just to use Iron Maiden examples, like something like Phantom of the Opera or Sign of the Cross or Seven Son of a Seven Son those go to other planets with their developments. Whereas I feel Blind Guardian, in general, it's going to lead us back to the chorus and repetitions of that, and that the chorus ideas are the best ideas. Um, so that it's just something in terms of the songwriting. It's something that, although I'm sure Blind Guardian has more street cred than Sabaton, lines them up a little bit more in that kind of camp where it really is going to come down to uh, vocal ideas in, in many, many, many songs. Um, and, uh, so then we get to black chamber, uh, which is a nice little vocal interlude. Like that's a cool little piece. And then we get to theater pain, which, um, a lot of people, a lot of people throw around, um, terms masterpiece and te I'm pretty stingy with my, my, with my use of that word. And, uh, and, and, and with my ratings, if you go to my rate, rate your music.com page, you'll see I've rated like 3,400 albums. I gave 28 albums of five out of five. So I, I like saying something is perfection and, and operating at that highest level and something that I as a creator aspire to create something at and would not give anything I've created that rating. A uh, theater of pain is that, that is an absolutely stunning song. <laughs> and I, and I, I think, I think it is, it is their first uh, truly, um, like they're just they're landing with this absolutely gigantic chorus, and and then even like you have these gigantic harmonies going, and then you have like the sea is calling. Like he's starting to layer stuff. Like I'm thinking of Steely Dan at this point in terms mm -hmm. of the way he's starting to layer these vocals. It is really really uh, just beautiful stuff, and um, that's it's, why I was laughing because I wrote a little note here that said "Don't love theater of pain." <laughs> Oh, that song didn't click for me on that for this one for some reason. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you prepared that little prop. That's so nice. I, I have, I have it, I have it, I have it at the ready. Alan um, Junior has entered the chat. <laughs> so, so the theater, I, I just think it's beautiful, and it is one of the gigantic, um, uh, just choruses like that. That is to me, the first taste of the best that they will ever do. Like Lord of the Rings and um, Last Candle are nearly there. Uh, but this one, I just think is just gigantic and lush. You get tw Quest for Tantalorn. Ah, this chorus is a little bit droopy for me. Um, Ashes to Ashes is awesome. Uh, the beat switches in that throughout. Like, man, this is like, at this point, Tom and Stout just is like, this, this guy is a truly creative player. The way he's switching it, you get Bard Song uh, Forest, um, really good. Um, not quite Lord of the Rings, um, but really, um, you know that again, that somber, more open thing. Uh, the the one that follows Hobbit, I think is pretty good. Uh, Piper's Calling is sort of 
you know, whatever. And then Somewhere Far Beyond is a song I think is good that has a great ending. So I know why it's why it is where it is. Um, because that last like two minutes where they get into the somewhere far beyond and then they open it up to the military snares. Um, he starts doing the different beats um, with the, like the boop, 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 boop. he starts like doing those little pulses. Um, and then you get those, the somewhere far beyond, like those happen. And then Hansi starts vamping against those. Give me 10 minutes of that. That's what I would, that like, like you can't give me too much of that stuff. That's the shit that, that Rodney James Dio is doing at the end of Stargazer and mm. going through like another plane of brilliance. Mm -hmm. And Hans clearly has the heart and the soul to do that stuff. Um, so I think this is a good song with a great ending. So a, a really strong way to end, end the album because it is ending at certainly at one of the high points other than Theater of Pain, which is brilliant despite whatever nonsense Marty's going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alan, did you did you rank this one? I didn't hear the ranking. Oh, um, fourth. Fourth. I, I rank it just be just be just below tails. Right on. Okay, Alan. All right. Um, yeah, this was again the first one that I got to hear, and uh, yeah, instantly loved it. Um, I agree again with most of what Craig said there. It, uh, I really like time. What is time? It's the, you know, Blade Runner, uh, inspired song. And the chorus is really great for it. And again, I just like, you know, that I, there was, it was so hard to find, you know, power speed metal like this in the mid nineties in the U S you know, and to find, you know, this German, you know, power speed band that's incorporating, you know, all these cool old, you know, science fiction and science fantasy things and making them into songs uh, was just really mind blowing. Uh, I remember there were rumors among fans for a while there before Nightfall and Middle Earth came out that uh, the band was considering doing a concept album on The Empire Strikes Back. And people were literally just like, you know, peeing their pants, imagining the possibilities uh, <laughs> if, if they had ever followed up on that, which they haven't yet. Um, but yeah, uh, lots of good stuff on this album. And this album really does show the band, yeah, trying out more different things and just nailing it every time. Journey to the Dark, yo, know, good track. Black Chamber is, again, short interlude, but it works okay. <laughs> theater of pain here you're really seeing the band yeah spread those bombastic wings for one of the first times and doing i don't know why i put don't love it. it i must not have listened to the right i must have looked at the wrong track <laughs> <laughs> i don't know yes your eyes were faulty or your ears or whatever is in between it happens yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it happens to the best of us. Some, some, maybe it'll click next time you play it. Maybe. Uh, you know, Quest for Tanalorn, uh, still a cool track. Ashes to Ashes, some folks were talking about this in the chat a couple of minutes ago. You know, here it's a little bit more of a throwback to the previous album. It's a little bit more of just, you know, a head down, you know, heavier, faster. So you still have, you know, remnants of that speed metal history on the album. They have not completely, you know, abandoned that just yet. But that chorus um, is a lot richer than like there's a lot going on in ashes to ashes with with the beats and the and the harmonies mm -hmm. like that that is yes it's what they did before but i think far better yeah again they're incorporate yeah it's got the sound of the old stuff but they're incorporating the new elements into it that's right craig uh and yes you're right you know the two part you know bard song they're going back to that lord of the rings well still tinkering with that formula and doing it very well on both these parts. But I agree. It's not as good as Lord of the Rings, but it's certainly quite yeah. good. Um, it's just when you compare it to that, it's not as good. Uh, someone mentioned Piper's calling in the chat earlier. They said, I don't understand why this song is there. I can't say I understand why it's there either. Um, bagpipe interludes are cool, I guess. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. I guess if I tend to think of it as it's a little bit of a reset button going into, you know, the big epic uh, closing title track, which yes, you know, they do a great job with that one wrapping up the album. So yeah, it's a bit more varied than some of the albums that have come before it, but they're really just firing on all cylinders. It, it's, it's almost like they can do no wrong here or almost no wrong because then you get to the cover songs and you are reminded that <laughs> they, they are human. You have spread your wings by queen <laughs> 
And I wrote, I will say before you continue on, my first line in my notes is, is there a worse fucking song out there than Spread Your Wings? I'm <laughs> there sure really there isn't. <laughs> mathematics tells us there has to be, but uh, every part of my being says you might have something there. Um, terrible song. That cover song almost ruined this album for my buddy Matt. When you know we got this as our introduction to Blind Guardian and he playing the whole thing and we're just in awe at every note and it gets to that cover song and he, he just flipped out he just fucking lost it. he's like what the fuck is this shit i don't I'm like dude it's okay it's just a bunch track it's at the end of the city he's like i don't want it in my house it fucks up the flow man it just oh, it's let me let me ask both of you a question because i looked multiple places and a lot of places do not list that as part of the album proper do you no, think it's not it's it's on my copy Spread your I wings. I think it is just. Oh, no, I have spread your wings on it, but I, but I don't think of that as part of the album proper because if that's part of the album proper, we're, we're, we're it's taking a hit. It's no, I, I agree. I agree, but no, I, I think it is technically a bonus track. And again, okay. co the cover song is stuck at the end of the album, so I'm not going to dock them a whole lot. Yeah, for that. Okay. but yeah, I, technically this one is a bonus track. Um, okay. Now you do get after that, you know, on a lot of versions, you get uh, the cover of Trial by uh, Trial by Fire, the old Satan track from Court in the Act, and they do a really good job on that. Um, they arguably do a better job than Satan did on the track, but that's probably a discussion for another evening. Um, and you also get a classic version rendition of Theater of Pain, so they give a, a different spin on that track, which again is cool and kind of foreshadows of a lot of the kind of stuff they would do, you know, in later years. So yeah, overall, it's a fantastic album. I like all the different experiments they're trying here, the different directions they're going in. Everything works well. I rank this one fourth and it could rank higher. Uh, the only reason I don't have it a little bit higher is that, I have found it's not the album I go back to and listen to as often Agreed. as the things that are ranked higher than it, that this one does sit on the shelf more. And some of that's probably just a result of it being the first one I ever got. I, I've played it a shit ton over the years. And so I don't feel the need to revisit it quite as much. So it doesn't quite make the top three, but it is still a fantastic a plus, you know, kind of album. Um, can't can't really fault it for anything except for that horrible queen cover um ugh, rough it's rough. okay marty uh we already know you hate theater of fate and that you think it's the worst song ever and uh you know there's completely worth screwed, noting, the push on put, that what else put, do you have to say about this album they put theater of pain on at the end as the bonus track just in case marty fell asleep during the album so yeah have in time to realize <laughs> you had two chances sir they gave you a second <laughs> chance they know well for me the since we kind of ended on the cover song thing and granted the album proper the vinyl probably does not have the cover tracks but i don't have the vinyl and you know i know zoller listens to music this way typically when i put on a record i listen to the whole thing whether it's on cd or record or tape whatever it is and you get you know, spread your wings on there. The Satan cover is okay, but it just comes to a point. I mean, obviously at this point, Blind Guardian are just not good at choosing cover songs. They shouldn't do it. You know, whether they're going to be a B-side, that's fine, but they should not even end up on the CD bonus tracks. It's just the cover songs are unnecessary and they detract from the album. They just do, you Marty, know, whether it was intentional Marty, or not. Taking your CD and, and cutting it with scissors and trying to <laughs> trim them out. <laughs> I, I haven't tried that yet but now that they got theater of pain on there my cd will look like swiss cheese <laughs> um but other than that i mean it's a more atmospheric album they're bringing in more cultural instruments and song ideas which is very cool um i mean cleaner production the less of an evolutionary jump from the last album everything feels more cohesive and realized musically which is cool so there wasn't a big jump in progression on this album i didn't think time what is time is a great song journey through the dark's a great song quest for tantalorn i liked a lot the bard song both in the forest and the hobbit i both they both felt really ambitious to me which is a ambition is definitely a word that becomes part of the blind guardian uh lexicon i guess because their music just gets so advanced you know the, these earlier albums that you can see little hints of it 
Um, I wrote, don't love theater of pain. I didn't elaborate in my notes and I don't remember right off the top of my head. The thing that surprised me the most, I liked this album a lot more going into it, uh, before this weekend. And after sitting with it a few times this weekend, I'm ranking it eight in the list. I was kind of surprised. There's some classic songs on here. You can't take it away from them. But like Alan said, this is just one of those, you know, out of all these albums, this is one of the few I, I grabbed, the, I grab it the least. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Marty, I think I figured out what happened here. Yeah, I was dropped on my head as a baby. Yeah. No, 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 no. Let's, let's just double check. You, you, you do, you didn't, uh, you, did you, <laughs> I'm going to give you an out here. Did you perhaps mistake it for the Motley Crue song? No, but that is definitely in my mind. I can see that whenever I see Theater of Pain, the cover from Motley Crue is in my head. Those laughing jesters. Yeah. I'm offering you a, an escape hatch here. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to stick to my guns on this. I'm keeping it at eight right now because there's some other albums I think that are way better in it than their catalog coming down the pike. For Fair sure. Enough. Speaking of which, it brings us to Imaginations from the Other Side. Imaginations from the Other Side, 1995. So probably, I'm wearing the shirt for it, so probably not going to be a huge surprise that this is, um, uh, that this is my favorite album by them. And and let me let me go a little bit further and say, I have some some other props. So this I think is the best power metal album ever made. Oh, second best. The first one is the first Lost Rising. This, this is the second best power metal album. <laughs> ever made. And I think this is the third. That's that's where I'm at. Like, I, I like, you know, Marty really got me more into Halloween and, and Gamma Ray and all that stuff. But I think this is on a different level. I will also continue to go down this, this road and say, this is my favorite heavy metal album from Germany. This is even the one. even the Michael Jackson ripoff song. This this, <laughs> album, this album I believe is the best example of a band that actually got better when they when they polished. But I'm sure there's some people who still want Yuli John Roth singing songs. That is the best side boob in heavy metal. Let's say, can we say, can we agree on that? When he took the photo, so this is my favorite heavy metal album from Germany. This is number two. So that's where that's where that ranks. I also in trance would, kills it. In trance kills it. No, I, it, 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 in chance has that Yuli John Roth stuff, man. There's that's there's some stuff to get. Past. I like in trance, taken by force, fly to the rainbow. I'm a huge fan of all those albums. I have every Scorpions album, including ones that nobody should own, like Eye to Eye and Pure Instinct or whatever. Like I have them all, but this is a special somber thing. And the last comparison I'll make is I think heavy metal has a pet sounds, and I think this is the pet sounds for heavy metal. I, it ah. is. It is absolutely a beautiful album, and the um, this is something I played. So uh, the, the guy who I do most of my music with outside of Toronto Valley, which I did with uh, Marty, uh, is a guy named Jeff Harriet, and we've been friends. Uh, Hefe. Yeah, Hefe, for, for over 30 years. Uh, he's a music professor, and I remember when I was getting him into some of the underground stuff, uh, putting a couple cuts from from this, and he was just... Uh, blown away by it and as as was i and as am i uh this album is incredible and i this is top 25 heavy metal albums of all time you see where it ranks for me in power metal history and german metal history and um uh it's it's great and um i'll just kind of go through it imaginations from the other side i wish this band did more songs like this I think this song, in a way, is a, is the best Demons and Wizards song that isn't a Demons and Wizards song. It has a heaviness. It has um, uh, it has space and in, in instrumental gravity, and not like in, in so far as they're leaving the space for the mood to develop. Uh, Tom and Stouch is a beast on this album. His drums sound huge, uh, and right behind those two Lost Horizon albums, I'm ranking this as like probably my, my third favorite performance in uh in like power metal history from a drummer it is incredible and he's hey, hey, hey. he is a real there you are how you doing man long time no chat um it, and and this is this is absolutely uh, uh you know this is a great beginning so much space so much mood and a different thing than they tried before clearly on the previous albums um uh, I I have no I do not have the remix version. Whoever's asking me that, 
Uh, Thanks for the uh, super chat too. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. But if there is a remix version, I'll get it. Like if someone puts out a new Grand Declaration of War, Rust in Peace, King Crimson, I, like I just I'm I'm there to just buy the album again. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyways, Imagination from the other side is great, and it's, it's it, I'm alive. It's probably my least favorite song on here. I feel that's a little bit like after the moodiness and the spaciousness of that first cut. They're like, let's show you that we can still just go full out. Um, a past and future secret. This is like a Lord of the Rings caliber, just beauty. It's just, it's just a gem. Um, script for my Requiem. Now here they're doing the full out thrashing in your face with like whack-a-mole beat. Um, but to me, succeeding, particularly with how ripping the vocals are at an extremely high level. And the mix of all the choir voices, which... Uh, uh, at this point are becoming mostly Hanzi to my ear. Um, this thing is, uh, this thing is, is, is terrific. Then you get in a Mordred song. One of like one of the best songs ever recorded. Uh, absolutely stunning. Um, you know, like that, like the, the uh, choir aspect of it and the, -da 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 -la. Like the, the crazy highs that are mixed in there and just how emotional this is. And, uh, it you know, there are acoustic versions of this. This thing, like you give this song to Kate Bush or Peter Gabriel or anybody, this song is going to be great. It's just the core ideas and melodies are so wonderful. Uh, Born in the Morning Hall has is a real, it's a pretty playful song in terms of the, the and, I, and I'll particularly point to Tom and Stouch's uh, performance in terms of some of the stuff where he's pulsing strangely kind of on the ride, the ding, the ding, and all that sort of stuff. It's great. Uh, then you get to Bright Eyes, uh, my favorite song by the band, one of my favorite songs ever recorded. Uh, an absolute, uh, you know, an absolute stunner, a masterpiece. Um, there, there are bands I like more than Blind Guardian who have never made anything as good as Bright Eyes. Um, I made a lot of, I made a lot of art and a lot of different mediums in my life. I've never come close to making anything as good as Bright Eyes. This is a stunning achievement and when i bring in when i bring up pet sounds and talk about the sophistication of harmonies this song of like oh just another fool just another and then the, i've been waiting for signs and then you get the cannons the create all of those things overlap like who has done that blind guardian has done and i can't think of another band that's ever done that level of just of, of beautiful harmonies in metal where, where I actually like the ideas that much. There are certainly other bands who've who've done this much in terms of overdubs, but where the ideas are this great and where you have a singer who has um, this much gravel and this much throat and this much heart and ideas that are this strong. I mean, yeah, again, like Bright Eyes, like Bright Eyes, it's worth owning the entire catalog. If that were the only way you could get this one song, that song is just an absolute special gem. Um, and then you get to another Holy War, which is fantastic. And, and mm -hmm. one of the other examples outside of the title cut of a song where I think one of the best ideas is actually not a vocal idea. The twin guitar melody at the end is without question the, the best twin guitar melody in their entire catalog. Like that's something they could sit on. Like this is like Thin Lizzy top of their game. This is Thin Lizzy Black Rose. This is Thin Lizzy Thunder and Lightning. And um, they could sit on that stuff forever. And uh, also like, although it ends with that stuff and it's really, really lush, those twin guitar melodies, this is a pounder. Like the, all of the switching, like there's a point, it's like, it's sort of like turning into something like um, Black Wind Fire and Steel by Man of War. It is, a, it is an assault um, that then goes into all of these melodies. Absolutely beautiful. And then, and, and the story ends is good. It's, I don't think it's quite as good as, I mean, it's coming off of, with Bright Eyes, another Holy War Mordred song, Imaginations from the other side. I mean, those are four of the, for me, four of the nine best songs um, uh, by this band. But this is a real pinnacle. And there are many, there are other bands that I rate more highly with them th than, than Blind Guardian because they have um, more consistent catalogs. Some other, some other aspects sort of pushes them over. But this, this is, I feel this is heavy metal history. And I, I feel I'm not overstating the case. So I say like, this is the pet sounds um for for heavy metal like i can't think of another metal album that's doing this with these impassioned vocals and yeah there are bands like catatonia and some of the vintersor orknagar stuff where you get lots and lots of layers but with this heart 
and this distinction of a voice and this and still this push and this edge um really really spectacular like certainly um something that i feel is a good example if you want to play something if you want to play heavy metal to someone who's not into metal and show them um a pinnacle and what it can be this is an album to show them and it reminds me a little bit of i remember reading interviews with dave mustaine around the time uh rust and peace was released and he said in his typically immodest way he said well if you don't like this album you're just not open to liking liking this kind of music and it's certainly true about rust and peace and it's certainly true about this if you don't like this album you're not it's I, I, it's hard for me to believe you're open to liking this kind of music it's just a it's a fantastic pinnacle clearly it's my number one favorite album by them and it is uh is just all-time hall of fame for me right on alan all right um before i talk about imaginations do you want to give a quick shout out for the live album that came out before it uh tokyo tales we're not going to you know rank or go deep on the live stuff we've got it's killer more than enough to talk about but th this is a amazingly good live album mm -hmm. uh, the band is absolutely on fire with this set the crowd is just fanatical uh throughout it's got an incredible track list featuring stuff from all the albums up through somewhere far beyond um Live albums, you know, can be real hit or miss, and I'm not always a huge fan of live albums. I tend to be pretty picky about them. Uh, this is an absolutely essential it's really live good. one. It, yep. It's top top notch. But you can that, you can hear the panties hit the stage when Barbara Ann comes on. They they, they do close <laughs> the uh, the show down with Barbara Ann. Every great power metal album has one flaw. Uh, Blind Guardian just had the same flaw on two different albums. <laughs> Ooh, that's tough that they close it out with that. Yeah, I'm not yeah. a big live album guy. Um, and uh, I'll look at it. I was like, oh, I should probably check that out. And then he said that. I'm like, I should probably not check it out. It's really good. I, I, it I is good. I, rumor has it, and it's just a rumor, scuttlebutt, you know, in the men's room. <laughs> uh, the, the show was running long. The band had a, you know, very uh, long bus trek to get to the next show the next day. And, and the crowd, they could tell the crowd was just going to demand encore after encore after encore. So they played Barbara Ann, and that shut things down real quick. Yeah. So they got out there on schedule. Please don't play the Queen song for fuck's sakes. It, it, it's just it's just hearsay. Now I'm not saying that's actually how it played out. It, it's just uh, something I read on an internet, you know, GeoCities or something back in the day. But uh, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit more about this album. Uh, Craig's already summarized it extremely well. This for me was an album when I first got it. It took a good amount of listening to fully get into because you know it does mark a departure uh from a lot of the you know speed that they'd had up to this point there's not as much of it on this album at all they're you know taking the other half of somewhere far beyond they're taking you know the bard songs and you know the uh you know theater and pain kind of stuff and they're expanding on that direction and they're they're leaving you know the lost in the twilight halls behind a bit here and it took me a while to process that i remember some folks did not give this a very good review when it came out because of that change they really felt like i don't want to hear blind guardian play slow i want to hear blind guardian play fast but Fools. I, I, I knew, you know, obviously I was already very Leave the hall. The band. I'd heard a lot of, I probably had heard all of their catalog up to this one by this point. I don't think I got this when it came out, but I think I had filled in all the gaps up to this point. Anyway, so it didn't click right away, but uh, it was like, I'm just going to keep playing this and we'll see where it goes. Uh, so for probably a solid month, it was the background music in the lab I was working at. So yeah, it was, you know, going in the afternoon, crack open, you know, a field jacket full of dinosaur bone, start dusting them off and gluing them together and just put, you know, imaginations on repeat in the background. And, you know, a month later, yeah, this was you know, a gem of an album. I recognize that this is really genius stuff. And uh, it's a lot to process. I, it take, I get it takes a month to process it. Yeah, there's you know? there's a lot going on, but it it really sunk in and it sunk in deep. It, it is a fantastic album full of very good ideas. Um, yeah, Imaginations from the Other Side is a great opener. Just uh, I like the way you described it, Craig, and saying that it, it's the good use of space in the song. 
it really does feel like, you know, you're opening the doors through into what's going to happen here. And it's just showing you there's the possibilities for this album are going to be off the chart. And yeah, it just, you know, tons of great songs here. A past and future secret is, you know, right up there next to Lord of the Rings for, you know, that kind of acoustic, just magnificence. Um, Let's see. Script for my Requiem. Yes. Well done. Mordred song. I'm glad you, that's one not a lot of people touch on, but yes, it's a really, really good deep cut on the album. You know, there's this pervasive kind of gloominess to a lot of the album. It's a little, you know, little despondent, a little bit like, you know, Hey, Hansi buddy, what, what's the matter? You, you seem a little down, uh, but it works so well in the context of the music. This is not the typical, happy german power metal start to finish this one yeah as you know the band's got a little bit of a downcast vibe but it adds so much texture and atmosphere to the tracks um what else we got here yes born in a morning call uh touch on bright eyes this is a great example of a band doing a song that has some you know more pop sensibilities about it almost kind of yeah just brilliant um Yes, this is a song you could play to lots of folks that aren't interested in heavy music and they might actually really dig it. Uh, it's incredibly put, incredibly well put together with the different layers and the different parts like you described, Craig. Uh, yeah, another Holy War, you still get, you know, still get, you know, some bursts of, you know, speed, pick up the tempo a little bit here and there. It's not completely gone, but they're doing more different, interesting things with it. And uh and the story ends, I like a lot. It just, it feels like a very strong closer here because once again, it's got that air of melancholy about it that, you know, they have poured forth all these amazing, interesting, intricate ideas throughout, you know, these nine songs. And this is where the story ends uh, that, you know, it's coming to its conclusion. And yeah, it, it is an absolutely amazing, it's another just, top shelf a plus plus you know however you want to rank it at the end of the day it, it's uh, as good as anything in their catalog but we have to rank them uh this is another one for me it kind of floats around in that you know two to three position uh for tonight i've got it ranked third um it could easily have been number two but we'll get to that in a little while but yeah, um, this period that. right here where you were talking, you know, Tales from the Twilight World, Somewhere Far Beyond, uh, Imaginations, this band, everything they touched was gold. Uh, these are some of my favorite albums. This is the stretch of albums, uh, including and even beyond this one, is the reason why that, you know, for a long time, I would tell anybody who bothered, who asked, like, you get that, you know, well, what's your favorite heavy metal band? Blind Guardian was the default answer for a long time based on this run of albums they did in the 90s. They they, they, they own the 90s. Like for they, they really do, yeah. For I've for talked some time. Who, I've like, talked some, I mean, ahead, like, Better Raw is awesome. Somewhere Out in Space is awesome. But, like, this, you know, I, I, obviously we haven't gotten to Nightfall yet, but for, for a run of four albums in the 90s in the traditional space, like, I'm... Who's who's beating this out? Nobody, nobody. The, the only band that comes close in my mind is Running Wild. Running Wild was doing some great stuff through the '90s too, but uh, yeah. I've always kind of thought you know each decade tends to have one power metal band that really mm -hmm. run. And in the 1990s, Blind Guardian, yeah, they they were at the top of the power metal pack, uh, yeah. or none. All right, Marty, let's hear your take on Imaginations from the other side. Well, it's also my number one in my list. Um, okay. And I basically started off, I've got a shit ton of notes here, so bear with me. Um, Blind no Guardian Mark III, The Arrival is the, the, header, the header of my uh, my notes. Um, all the speed metalisms are largely cast aside on this album for more of a grandiose and melodically charged uh, body of work. Sophistication has found a home. In their songwriting which is here to stay at this point hansi rises to the challenge with unfaltering cleans and completely passionate screams that linger in the newly realized higher register of his voice the tracks uh the title tracks amazing 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 start to this album so triumphant in that chorus it's great 
a, a past and future secret, very folk style ballad with great gr- ballad with great vocal melodies. Again, clean Hansi is amazing. He's just so soulful in his singing style. Uh, the script from my Requiem, Hansi really pushes his limits on this punchy and dramatic riffs backing him up. Uh, Mordred song, very mature manipulation of musical styles between folk, classical, and metal. Born in a Morning Hall, pure majestic excellence. Aggressive, super aggressive song with power chorus. Bright Eyes, you're completely right, Alan. It's very, it's got almost a poppy sensibility, but I chose to write more of a spacious track. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, it's just a really well, uh, very emotive song. Another Holy War. I turn my page sideways. Uh, some speed elements on this one. Attack. Um, and, the, and the story ends. Finally, a proper ending track. A lot of emotion and hinting at what's to come. So, yeah. Number one for me. It's a fantastic record. Um, the notes greatly outweigh the album that's coming up next. Speaking of which is this guy right here. Nightfall in Middle Earth um 1998 get it in the frame here zoller why don't you start us off with uh, your thoughts on this one cool you got you, uh, alan mentioned the the live thing is there any point and 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 the answer can just be a simple note in discussing this thing the forgotten tales i don't th- i don't, I don't think- have it alan told me it was crap so i never got it it's it's just it's it's like are you excited about inferior versions of excellent songs here you go <laughs> you want do you want you want Bright Eyes and Mordred song without drums and electric? <laughs> Here they are. So, I mean, you have lesser good versions of incredible songs. Um, uh, there's a Mike Oldfield song that I don't know called To France, which is pretty good. Um, you get an mm-hmm. instrumental version of Theater Pain, so yet another time for Marty to come around on that. That's how <laughs> swing you. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, Surfing USA, Mr. Sandman. No, it's okay. So, let's get into let's get it. <laughs> who's choosing who in the band is like whatever drummers in the band at the time gets to choose the fucking cover songs. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, so, um, as I said at the beginning, uh, Nightfall in Middle Earth, this is this is where I this is where I began. Um, brief aside, um, I, I, I the, the novel I just finished writing is fantasy and, um, Fantasy really is is how I improve my skills uh, writing. Uh, I, I got back into it as an adult uh, some some time ago, and I hadn't revisited Tolkien in a super long time. And uh, and and I may re- I'm a slow reader, so it's I'm, I'm pretty deliberate with my choices. But surprisingly excellent is this thing, Children of Hurin. So if you've only read, um, I haven't even heard of that fucking book. Right. If you. <laughs> Read if you've only read The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, which is all I'd read of his, and I failed reading the Cimmerillion as a Me kid. Too. This I got about three chapters in. I'm like, fuck this. This is uh, this I'll get ready here. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ready. This this thing is this thing is great. Has like the, the style is, is somewhat biblical, but just on the on that note, I just I just thought to bring it up because well, is that J.R. Tolkien or is that his son Christopher's? It's Tolkien. It's they they did a little his son did a little bit of editing, but this I think it was probably pulled out of the Cimmerillion or notes, but this is Tolkien. And in some ways it's like his least flawed piece, and it's just this beautiful, extremely sad, like it's incredibly mm. sad fable, incredibly dark. Um, but I was just, it was kind of nice. It's like, uh, you know, like, like this really got me into reading as like a 12, 13 year old to then just discover, oh, there's another, there's another great book by him. So just, a, just an aside for those who, who are into reading fantasy, which I am and, uh, and Hefe, if he's still in the chat, certainly is and reintroduced me to, to, uh, reading a lot of that stuff as, as an adult, uh, children who are about as good as it gets. It's just a, it's a lovely book. So Nightfall on Middle Earth. This is my introduction to the band, and and man, is it overwhelming. There's so much music going on here. Uh, yeah. I, I I I really like this album. This one, um, this one I rank as number two, uh, and and one of the reasons it would never, it couldn't dethrone um, Imaginations from the other side is it has a it has a few songs I don't care for, um, not bad songs, but ones I, I don't particularly like. Uh, it has all of the talking in between of like we need to go to the realm and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, the narration I, was unnecessary. You know, whenever I hear that stuff, I'm always expecting some dude to say, 
and they were the Metal Kings. <laughs> <laughs> tell me a story, Craig. <laughs> Hello, Grandpa. Tell me a story. <laughs> so, so that doesn't happen. It's never they were the Metal Kings, but it was. Um, and, and and that stuff is fairly well done and isn't it doesn't bog it down. Like I think actually some of those, you know, you you like you mentioned in terms of that whatever Piper's calling as like a reset button, Alan. I think that some of these really work. I mean, obviously they're pushing forward a narrative that I sort of kind of follow, not really, not let's say not at all. Um, but they're probably presenting some of that stuff, but it works as a nice palate cleanser with the deluge of music that is in your face when, whenever these songs kick in. So Into the Storm is the first song I ever heard by this band. And um, it's just riffs in your face. And this one has a lot of like that, and that's the sound. Like clearly, um, I probably should have said this earlier, this is where it's clear that like at some point, Brian May was cloned and he got it. He took a couple of shots at Kirk Hammett and they're like one or two other guys in the veins but like that's what's going on here. It's it's complete. Um, um, it's it's complete. Brian May worship with that really lush, very pretty tone, stepping on the wall, doubling it up. Uh, but into the storm is you know like the. Uh, this is going to sound like an insult, and I and, I, and my guess is it influenced the band, and I don't mean it as an insult. But some of the zigzagging of the riffs, like underneath the part where it's like. We are following the wind. And there's the riffs that's I feel like there's almost like a slight video game quality to some of those licks that remind me a little bit of Dragon Force, which I never got into, I, but I don't hate them. Um, but there's like a kind of a surprising jaggedness. And, and this, is a, this is the album where I would say something that's different, like the drum sound on Imaginations from the other side is incredible and spacious and gigantic. Here... You have so much stuff in the mix. It's all fighting for space. Yeah. And, um, uh, so the drums don't sound big on this album. Uh, and sometimes, like the chorus and Mirror Mirror, like I can barely hear the snare. So there's a lot of music going on, lots of stacked guitars. Uh, and But Into the Storm is a, is a really good song. Um, and that, that kind of post-chorus uh, lick is really, really nice. So it doesn't take that long to get into one of the ones I don't care for. Nightfall is just there, there's obviously they, this band plays with medieval kind of Renaissance stuff and like overtly classical stuff, but the whole nightfall. Oh no, thank you. It's just, I feel it's, it's a little too beer hall obvious and the crowd loves it. They loved it when I, when I saw it and maybe both of you like it, but there's, there's a line oh, yeah. that's, there's a line that's crossed, and that line, uh, Rhapsody is on the other side of that line uh, for me, and this crosses that line. Like this, I, I could hear this chorus in a Rhapsody song, and I wouldn't be surprised. Um, um, uh, Curse of Fanor, now we're, now we're into the really good, dolorous section of this album, where, and th this song, this song is really good. His singing. Uh, his his he is incredibly aggressive with his singing in those verses, like really really ripping and um, uh, lots of like and and you this is and like this is one where it just feels like leads are sprinkled all over the place and I feel like you were getting a sense like with with Andre Ulbrich like he's a lead guitarist who's interested in putting the bed for him to just sort of spring up all over the place with these Brian May sort of things. Um, then we get to Blood Tears which is incredible. And this to me is a song that ranks with Theater of Pain, Bright Eyes, Mordred's Song, uh, Another Holy War as like absolutely masterful. And there are other bands that I might like more that have no song as good as Blood Tears. And this is like the, like in general, these guys, when they go sad, they go gold or platinum or double platinum, whatever you're going to call this thing. The um, uh, th this, is, this, is just a, this is just a great, this is just a great tune. Is this this is the the this is the cut off your old friends and right? This is that one. Which and, one? Yeah, this is that. That's the part that's thrown in after the blood tears chorus. Oh, okay. He adds in that part. Just absolutely spectacular stuff. The space at the end of the song where they put the chimes and the synth 
leaving some space as they did on Imaginations from the Other Side. Really, really great. So that song I think is is uh, is is fantastic. Um, I thought you know Curse of Fanor I thought was great. Here we have something that I put at masterpiece level. Mirror Mirror I think is great in terms of their really fast ones. This is one of their best. This is one where like man I, I like it's hard to hear the snare with all the shit going on with and he's moving around and it's it's it, there's they're starting to kind of clog up the mix. But um, in terms of like an overtly poppy chorus. It's a really good one, and the switches of beats from um, like kind of the the whack a mole clobbering to the alternating and all that sort of stuff. There's just a lot of really nice rhythmic stuff going on underneath that makes it, even though it's a little mirror mirror, definitely other than Nightfall feels like the poppiest song on the album, but still makes it um, a, a creative and metallic kind of experience. Um, then we get to Noldor, another great one. So that this run of songs is is as good as anything outside of like uh, imaginations from the other side. Like that, I mean that um, when when it's uh, they get to that final course, it's like the the dead winter rain, and then Hansi yells out that ah! like that incredibly ripping high. Like you know, I'm I'm an opera fan. Um, not as much as I once was, but like that's that you're hoping for that moment in in a, in a, in an aria in an opera, and it is it's spectacular. Like that's you know like six minutes in, you're landing with this climactic yell that the whole song has built to. It's just great songwriting. Um, then you get to not great so songwriting with "Time Stands Still" at the Iron Hill. It was already it's a little bit doomed with that title. The already rhyming title is going to put it a little bit. It's going to make it a little bit hard, and it's just a little bit too obvious. So not bad. Like Nightfall, I don't think these are bad songs, but like set against Mirror Mirror or, um, you know, uh, Noldor, uh, like it, it it doesn't land particularly well. Um, uh, Thorns, I think, is really good. My guess is Marty ranks this one highly because it's <laughs> – it leaps right into it leaps right into the six eight. I'm like, this is a Marty. It's just like guaranteed. Yeah. Um, uh, but that really strong chorus, uh, and then the elder, uh, beautiful song, absolutely gorgeous layering. This is something that compares again to like Lord of the Rings kind of stuff. And when you get that final like that, I say farewell, and he bends up to that crazy high, like. Not there are not many moment like better moments in like vocal history of of, of metal or, or anywhere else that are quite that are quite like that. It's just really impassioned, really um uh yeah, just really, really memorable, really good stuff. Uh uh when sorrow sang is good. Um the twin guitar melody in the chorus. I, I like I was like if, if that's a call back to the the what's going on in Into the Storm, I think they're bringing back that idea. Uh, and that's a really strong song. I kind of wish it ended there. I think Dark Passage is pretty good. Uh, it certainly has the really, like, harmonically ambiguous ending that, like, slowly marching on, like, that weird, like, cliffhanger. Like, I, I, I sort of feel when I hear the end of that album that it's like, oh, it's, it seems like it's about to go into a sequel. Like, that, that melody that's at the end of Wolf Slayer Abyss that then they picked up again at the beginning of Grand Declaration of War. This to yeah, me, yeah. like that sort of thing yeah. where it doesn't resolve. It's a really uneven like oscillation that doesn't resolve in kind of a normal way. And I was like, oh, this this is to lead into maybe a sequel album. But overall, tons of excellent stuff, an incredible run with the Curse of Feanor, brilliant, Blood Tears, masterful, Mirror Mirror, brilliant, Noldor, masterful run. Like that's an incredible run. Like. Now, you know, again, bands bands that I might rate similarly or higher might not have four songs in a row as strong as that bunch. So really good stuff. All right. What did you rank that? Your number what? That's number two. Number two. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Alan. All right. I also have this one ranked number two. I'll cover that right away. Um, this, in a lot of ways, is Blind Guardian's watershed moment. This is where they kind of hit their peak popularity uh this is where you know several folks in the chat and you know craig you also said you know, this is a lot of people's introduction to the band yeah. you know because this is the first album that got 
you know more widespread access especially here in the states and yeah it's a crazy point to jump into the band because it is so overwhelming an album i love the album you know and its musical merits it always ranks a little even higher for me because I, a bit of a tolkien nerd i'm rusty on my tolkienisms but uh, you know like his work and Silmarillion is something I've read several times. It's been a while, but used to whenever I had to, uh, you know, fly to science conferences or field work or anything, the Silmarillion was the book I threw into, you know, the carry-on bag and would just reread, you know, flying around and sitting in the airports. Do you, do you recall, was Children of Hurin a chapter in that or was it not? I don't remember offhand. It may be like a... It, Tolkien had so many alternate texts for different things he wrote about. Children of Huron might be, you know, a different manuscript that covers some of the same stuff from Silmarillion. Okay. I, I'm not sure offhand. Okay. I'm going to circle back and read some. After reading this, I'm like, I'll get through all the elf history because the that sense of history and 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 and, and richness mm -hmm. with it's, it's it's probably worth the effort, even if some of that book is um, a bit dry. Yeah, it is. The trick with the Silmarillion is um, it's almost the dead opposite of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. You know, with the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you know, you spend three long books covering about one year or so of time and following these people in great detail, you know, with, uh, you know, they stop and spend, you know, half a page describing every single, you know, field and flower they walk past, which is part of the beauty of that trilogy. The Silmarillion, on the other hand, you get one book and it covers i don't even remember how many thousands of years it right. all just compacted down so it's that, the bible it's the the middle earth bible yes it, it very much it was tolkien always meant for it to be you know his version of genesis it, yeah. it is the story of creation for middle earth it's you know that first age it's the story of the garden the fall from grace the serpent uh, it's yeah it's very much his version uh and they did an incredibly good job of taking that very difficult material and putting it into this, you know, conceptual rock opera of an album. So, you know, for me, having you know, been familiar with the Silmarillion, you, listening to the album, and like you know, the little voice interludes and stuff, I can definitely see where to some people they feel kind of cheesy or kind of a throwaway. But yeah, a lot of times those are you know key characters recounting key <laughs> moments from the story. Even you know just the the intro part. Um, you know, like the, where there's all these battle sounds and these two kind of raspy old sounding guys talking you know, like the first time I'm listening to the album, when I first got it, it's just like, okay, what's going on here? You know, and then I replay and like clicked. I was like, oh shit, I know exactly what's going on here. The one that kind of sounds like the Butler is Sauron, you know, the major big bad guy of the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy. He's the manservant in this conversation, talking to Morgoth and it's the end of the story. They're beginning with the very final battle at the end of the first age of man, when the elves are about to overrun their, you know, final, you know, compound. And Sauron's trying to convince Morgoth to, you know, flee, go back into hiding. You know, we'll get them next time. We'll get the band back together and give it another show. And Morgoth's just like, fuck it. No, I'm tired of this shit. You go. You know where to hide. There are places, you know, he's like, there are places down below. But he's just like, you go on. You carry this fight on. I am tired of this shit. <clears throat> I'm just going to wait here and accept my fucking fate. And then they rewind you know, thousands of years to the very beginning with the Noldor and Morgoth corrupting the original elves and everything. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it tells the story incredibly well. Uh, through the music and through the lyrics and through the little voice narration. So the album's always going to get huge bonus points for me. When I'm in my geeky Tolkien phases, this album gets bumped up to spot number one. Haven't you know been in the Tolkien phase for a few years, so it's slid down to number two in the discography. Um, but yeah, I won't go through it song by song necessarily. There's a lot that I like. You know, Nightfall, yes, you know, it definitely has that chanty sing-along vibe. It works well. It's still a pretty song. Uh, mirror, mirror, you know, is more upbeat, more forceful, but again, yeah, is always a, a crowd pleaser, a good one to get everybody chanting and raising their lighters, cell phones, you know, whatever illuminating device they're carrying with them at that point. Um, 
Time Stands Still on the Iron Hill. Now, that's one, uh, again, yes, the title is a mouthful, but it's another one of those really important points in the story. So I like the song a lot because they do a good job of conveying what's happening. This is you know, Fingolfin's last stand against Morgoth. It, this is one of the pivotal battles where, once again, the elves are going to get their asses kicked, and, but this is the paragon of all elfdom riding out and challenging this big bad motherfucker one-on-one -on -one, call off the orcs i call off the elves you and i throw down on this shit now and if you don't face me you're a fucking punk and a coward and he loses he won he wounds morgoth seven times and he still dies at the end of it so you know what it's the the lyrics where they're changing and kind of at the end uh, let me pull them up here real quick. You know, it's you know, it really conveys you know the tragedy of you know this battle when they're through. You know, uh, yeah, you know the Elven King's broken. He stumbles and falls. The most proud and most valiant, his spirit survives. He is. He was kind of the Elves' last great hope, and now he's dead. So it just fits in and conveys what's happening there so incredibly well even the cover art you know it's another one by uh andres marshall who's done a lot of covers for them but even you know his depiction there just fits perfectly it's luthien dancing before morgoth right before you know she and her uh baron the human she's in love with which is you know elf human you're not supposed to do that kind of thing but they do and they're kind of the salvation for uh, you, the elves. The elves fight this battle for thousands of years and can get nowhere with it. And she, with the help of a human, actually is able to recover a Silmaril, which nobody thought would ever happen. So just, you know, it's this beautiful scene of the elf. You know, she's in the darkest pit of, you know, Tolkien's version of hell in front of his version of Lucifer. And her, you know, the beauty is still able to overcome it there. And it really translates well in the cover art even. So the album works for me on those levels because it did such a great job of translating what the story is all about. It, is it, it's a long album. It's a lot to process. There are parts of it that are, you know, maybe I tune out a little bit more than others. But overall, I consider it a real triumph. Uh, for a project, it's an achievement. It, it is, you know, their, I, well, Imaginations may be a more sort of, you know, fun album to listen to song by song by song. This is like their version of moving pictures. Th this is something, they, they achieve something on this album that few bands would ever achieve and Blind Guardian would not achieve again. After this, they would have to change gears a little bit because you just can't follow this up. So uh, Nightfall, Number two for me, uh, an incredible album. Bravo, Alan. Bravo. Um, yeah, uh, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. So, so Marty, Marty, what's your take on the uh, you know uh, geopolitical significance of the Battle of Dagor Bragalak uh, covered in songs seven, nine, and eleven? <laughs> I got about three chapters into the Silmarillion and um, not enough pictures. I'll just say, not enough pictures. <laughs> um, it was like reading the Bible, and I didn't read that either. So I gave that, I gave it up. Um, everybody's bitching about the Ring of Power, which of course means that I like it. I've, I'm going into it with no backstory. I'm just enjoying a show as it is. Cool. I don't care about Alan. You'll probably watch it and want to flip over tables and shit, but um, <laughs> I'm enjoying it. But anyway, um, for me, this is my number two album as well. Um, I wrote down almost, almost Power Metal Perfection. Uh, the great sense of evolution and composition on this, though I feel the album is very front loaded, hmm. three quarters loaded, I would say. I think it's pretty much damn near perfection. Into the storm, nightfall, curse of Feanor, mirror, mirror, time stands still. Um, Thorn is a very emotive and excellent song. I love that song. The Eldar, it's a beautiful piano ballad. Um, when sorrow sang to me that should have been the album closer they should have ended on that song but it continued on um with uh there was some anticlimactic um tracks a dark passage um this song 
it, it sounds like a wrap up, wrapping up the story song. Um, it's good, but it lacks quality of the other stuff that's before it. You know, then you fill in all the narration towards the end. It just seems like they're stalling at that point. Like I said, I think when Sorrow sh sang should have been the, the album closer and the album would have been. What'd you say? 100% agreed. Yeah. Uh, that, yes, it's a stronger it's a stronger close. It's a stronger close. And they put in the narration and a dark passage is just a wrap up song. It's just not the quality isn't there. Um, it it so might my number two. A lyric con like this is the kind of thing I'm assuming because it's, it's hard to imagine they thought that, that Dark Passage was a better song, that the, the content, the lyrical content in the story drove them to continue past that point. It's sort of, it's sort of my guess. Because yeah. it's like, I, I mean, it's, you know, obviously I, I, like, I don't think Dark Passage is bad and it has that ambiguous end, but I mean, you said exactly what I had said, which is like when Sarah was saying, it's just a much, it's just much more memorable. It's, it's, it's much better. It seems much more like a landing moment. Yeah. Do you know, Alan? Do you know, or or Marty? Do you know if if they if they had intended to do a sequel to this ever? Really, that ending always just left me thinking: like, are they going to do a part two to this? I have no I idea. have never heard that they were going to do a follow up. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, again, the album kind of wraps up, you know, the end of the first age of man. So there's more that they could follow up and do with the second age. I was actually typing to someone in the chat. Yeah, the Rings of Power show is covering the second age of Middle Earth. It, it has nothing to do with the Silmarillion. So you know, get your facts straight, nerds. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, so there's obviously, I mean, there's still thousands of years of history. They could follow up. They could do, you know, the whole tale of Numenor would be another fantastic you know, concept album. Numenor is Tolkien's version of Atlantis. It's the lost continent that, you know, it's, it's mankind at their pinnacle and falling into corruption and eventually being swallowed by the ocean as, you know, retribution from the gods for, you know, uh, falling in line with evil. So, yeah, the, the land given to man by the elves, basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was supposed to be their heaven on Earth and they ascended to it and then they fucked it all up. Uh, yep. But no, I don't I've never heard that they had like a, you know, a, a, a nightfall part two. Okay, we're going to do. Okay, we're moving now into 2002. We've crested the 2000s with A Night at the Opera. So, uh, so here we are, this thing. Um, yeah, this happened, and it's an album. And uh, this was crushing when it came out. And I think I trashed it in, in Metal Maniacs. I'm, I'm not positive. I know I had a promo for this. And, and, and when I say trashed, again, like the, the, the basement, the floor for this building, uh, the, the, the floor for this band is decent. Like their worst material is just so thoughtful and has so much material. Like uh, there, there's enough going on that's not going to be terrible. But um, I got some promo and it might have just been and then there was silence and I might have heard that ahead of time. And I was like, oh, man. This is a band that has spent a whole lot of time in the studio, way, 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 way too much time in the studio. And, um, you know, one of the things when we, you know, when when the three of us like started going back and forth in terms of doing this Blind Guardian special uh, and doing the ranking, I was like, oh, man, I'm going to need to listen to Night at the Opera again. And um, it is not bad. I mean, I have it ranked 11th. Uh, it's not a bad album. Um, it is it is the second best Marx Brothers movie. Uh, Duck Soup being Duck Soup being the best, um, without doubt. What you one could argue that Day at the Races is better than Night at the Opera in terms of Marx Brothers movies, but um, all of them are far superior to this album. Um, so the the mix, and I've listened to two different mixes of this to see if anything would be helped. Uh, it's and and, and it isn't. Um, I think the original mix you're really basically getting vocals and drums and then all that other crap that they're cramming in there, certainly not much in the way of guitars. And this was to me, the beginning, um, uh, this to me was the beginning of, uh, blind guardian sounding a little bit like Hansi Kirsch in the guardianettes. And, <laughs> uh, it, it is, it's, it's, it's tedious. Um, there's so much music going on here. I think it would be almost impossible to go through an entire song and not find some melodies I like and some melodies I dislike and a bunch that I'm sort of lukewarm on. There's so much music going on here. 
So again, like Blind Guardian that's worst, I think is making an album overall that I think is mediocre rather than straight up bad. Um, but yeah, I think I reviewed this at Maniac because I remember having the promo and it wasn't until recently that I'm like, maybe I should revisit this thing. Um, and basically I'm glad I had it for the purpose of this thing. So kind of going through it, um, I don't need to like just in insult a lot of songs, but Precious Jerusalem, uh, I like. Uh, not a ton. This is one where they have a straight up musical quotation from Andrew Lloyd Webber's Jesus Christ Superstar. They just bring in music and sing it. Uh, so you're getting, you're certainly getting a lot more exotic instrumentation. I don't know, like tablas and I don't know half of what's going on inside those. And I don't like this album enough to actually determine what's going on in all of those. But there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of stuff. You're getting more Middle Eastern melodies all over this album than ever before. Um, like a massive amount. Uh, the guitar, again, just completely smothered under the waves of, of Hansi Kirsch. And I don't know if there was a shift in songwriting, but this to me started to feel like, like it's Hansi Kirsch's band and there are dudes who play with him. Um, but Precious Jerusalem, I think is pretty good. Um, it's, it is a, um, it's an album that I would, uh, I recognize the ambition uh, cause it's, it's there, but it just, it, you know, it, it, it just, it just didn't land. And I don't know if it was something where after nightfall of middle earth, he felt like, well, the only way we can up the ante is just by adding more eclectic instruments and more shit into the mix. And, uh, but that, that, that's what happened. Anyways, I think the first tune is decent battlefield, way too happy under the ice. I like half of the chorus, um, the part where he's singing under the ice. So you have half of a good chorus. Mm -hmm. Sadly Sings Destiny is the other song I like on the album. I like two songs. Um, the Maiden in uh, Maiden in the Mistral Night. This is a whole lot of a whole lot of Jethro Toll going on here. Really particularly good bass lines for what it's worth. I said, like you can dig, there's a lot buried in these songs. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like mm -hmm. you can find stuff. It's just, is it good enough to bring you to bring you there? Um uh Wait for an answer. So this is going to sound extremely insulting, but I, but uh, for those who know the Arnel Pineda era journey, here, wait for an answer is basically this. And I like some of the Arnel Pineda journey. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan in general of, of journey. Um, I think Neil Sean is one of the, the best guitarists ever in terms of Lee's. I think he's a phenomenal player. Uh, this feels like that sort of thing. Um, it, it definitely has like a major key uplifting sort of thing going on. Don't really love it in this context. Soul Forged. Um, I mean, this is just straight up Rhapsody. Like, this is like, and this is probably not even a particularly good song on a Rhapsody album. Uh, Age of False Innocence. Um, you got some stabbing string sort of stuff going on. Um, you get the the Jesus Christ Superstar melody that they sing in the first song gets a gets a reprise here for whatever reason. Maybe there's some concept here going on other than just like how much shit can we cram into this album? Um, and uh, yeah, and then and then there was Silence, which is my first taste of this album because that was released ahead of time. And I'd say like this is I, I, in some ways sort of like Satan's Fall um, by, by Merciful Fate. It's like how many times are you going to stop this song to drop in a new idea? <laughs> and and it is that thing. It just doesn't feel like a song, and and it just feels like here are a bunch of ideas. There's some good stuff at the end. You get like at like the 12 minute mark. I have like noted. Uh, Marty will like it at 10:20. It switches into like a six eight rhapsody thing. So it's gonna be on uh, which song? On on uh, and then there was silence. There's gonna be a moment there, but you may have just tuned out. This may have just. Put Sleep by then. Um, there's some cool. There's some cool counterpoint going on with the guitars, and then at the end of this song, and like this is the kind of thing, like just in terms of context, I feel like the end of this song is pretty strong. Um, you've gotten through like ten minutes of not particularly good to start landing on something that feels like a song, and then you have these big fills, and 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 I believe this is the final Tomen Stouch uh, album. You have these big fills that should be like real arrival fills. Like think of those monster fills you get in Heading for Tomorrow when they come around to the chorus for the final time. They've gone away, they've come back, they've gone away again for longer, and then they come back, and then you get these gigantic fills that feel like, you know, like the world is cracking and just fantastic stuff. So this has the space there, except that, like, the, like 
like the drums sound like they're coming from someone's iPad in another room. And it's just smothered by how much crap is in this mix. So <laughs> ultimately, there's a ton of music here. If this were the only, and, and this is where I say, like, I, I like to think, like, I mean, my taste is pretty consistent. I, I thought similarly about this album way back when. But I, I do wonder if this were the only album they ever released and I spent 10 times as much time with it, how much I would find to enjoy. Because there's undoubtedly good music here. These people, like, you know, particularly Hanzi at this point, they're coming up with a lot of stuff. And every song is going to have something of value. Um, but like in terms of holding my attention or feeling coherent or having super memorable stuff, really nothing does. I mean, Sadly Sings Destiny, Precious Jerusalem, you've got two songs that I like. So this album is number 11 on the list. And just in terms of context, I was, I was incredibly disappointed. Like when Countdown to Extinction came out, I'm like, what happened? And, you know, and probably what happened to people who listen to who do we like, who do what uh, who do we think we are or whatever the, the deep mm -hmm. purple followed up machine head. They got to be like, what the hell happened? Like these this is these people are op operating at a superhuman level, making art of the highest caliber. And now we have this with this. I think we know what happened. Like there was some pandemic in Germany we didn't know about. They were locked in the studio <laughs> for two years. And they just kept recording shit and just adding it in every song. <laughs> yep. That album. I don't have a lot of good to say about it. All right. Alan. All right. Well, yeah, I'm still pretty much on the same track with Craig on this one, too. This is the first one we've gotten to tonight. I don't have a physical copy of to look at. So that tells you something right away. Uh, when this album, you know, the buildup for this album coming out was pretty big there was a lot of hype around it the press was huge for this record the the century press media was pressed the yeah. fuck it was the century media yeah. they know, pressed um, the shit out of it you know your nightfall you know hit again you know, really broken the band huge and even beyond that kind of zooming out power metal had made this huge comeback in these years too you know 1997 you had you know rhapsody and hammerfall come out and really you know bring those styles back into vogue then in 98, you had Nightfall, Middle Earth, you know, was a huge success. And so you know, this was the first Blind Guardian album coming out when power metal was cool again. And so, yes, there was tons of focus, you know, on this album and this band. But I remember like, you know, yeah, a lot of the little interview clips and stuff leading up to it. You know, they were talking so much about, you know, oh, yeah, you know, the cover art's going to be just crazy busy. And, uh, you know. Yes, we're, you know, drawing on that, you know, Queen, we're using, you know, obviously it's a nod to Queen using the same album you know, title uh, and stuff. And I just remember thinking, it's like, they seem to be focusing on all the wrong things. This is not really, none of these little tidbits are getting me really hyped or excited for what the album's going to sound like. And I kind of knew that you can't really follow up nightfall and middle earth with something at that same level that you've got to shift gears and do something a bit different. Yeah. Again, I'm not really well versed in Rush's catalog, but you know, it can't, it does feel like, you know, one of those movements where you don't follow up moving pictures with moving pictures part two, that's just not possible. So you're going to have to do something a bit different. And, you know, with this one, they really, yeah, they embrace, you know, this more symphonic side of things, and it's just, yeah, as Craig said, it's too much stuff crammed into a space. And it's not terrible. Yeah. I never thought it was terrible, but it's the album you, I mentioned before with Imaginations. I got that one. There's a little bit of a tough nut to crack, but I stuck with it. And yeah, I discovered a glorious album. You know, with this one, tough nut to crack. Stuck with it for a long time. And, and I eventually decided this just wasn't a very good album. Uh, it, not terrible, not a bad album, but it was, uh, by Blind Guardian standards, this was the first time I was kind of let down. And there's just too much crammed in here, but none of it ever completely gels. You know, for instance, looking through the songs, yeah, Precious, Jeru Precious Jerusalem, excuse me, is you know not bad. You know, Battlefield is okay. Under the Ice, yeah, again, I like about half that song as well. Um, parts of it are okay, parts of it aren't. Sadly Sings Destiny, okay, decent enough there. After that, you, you get into this you know, string of songs, Maiden, Wait for an Answer, Soul Forged, uh, Age of False Innocence, Punishment Design, Divine. 
I can't really tell you what those songs sound like. Um, you know, those songs have never stuck with me. None of them have ever stood out. They're, they're there. They're not bad. But this is, again, a band that you're used to having things immediately stick in your head. This is the band of, you know, big choruses, big sing-along moments, huge, memorable, catchy hooks. And there's like five songs there, and I'm looking at the titles right now thinking, well, I've heard those a bunch of times, but uh, they're there. They're songs. Okay. It, the closer, then there was silence. Yeah, again, if that had been parred down to a six or seven minute song, might have closed on a good note. But as it is, yes, it just kind of keeps going. And there's some good parts, like you said, Craig. There's good stuff sprinkled into all these songs, but it's really a chore to extract the good parts. And even if you do, you're still left with all this stuff in between them that just doesn't work that good. Uh, I, it's a very long album. You know, there's not a single song on here. I'm looking at the track listing now. There's nothing under five minutes. I'm not. There's not even anything under five and a half minutes. Well, there's one track at 518. So, uh, you know, every song just takes you a long time to get through, and you just... At the end of every one, I don't really feel like the payoff is worth the time invested in it. So for me, I've got, if I didn't say before, I've got this one ranked, I've got it ranked number nine. And to be hey, honest, I was, a, I was a little surprised it came in at nine. I thought it might come in a little bit lower than that going into the ranking. Um, and we'll discuss the albums below it and why. And again, <laughs> it sounds like I've shit on the album a lot here, which wasn't really my intent. It is not a horrible album. It's a serviceable album. But this is a band, like we've discussed earlier, they, they've come off of a run where they owned an entire decade in this genre. They, everything they have touched on those first six albums almost is you know, just you know beautiful, classic, top-of-the-line stuff. But here, I want to use the phrase jumping the shark, but that's not really applicable because this isn't... Um, you know, unforeseen. It's not a huge stylistic change from where they've been heading. It, it just feels, yes, they've pushed it too far. The creative of excess. Point. Yeah. That, that, as usual, Marty, you can say it in three words where I've tried to say it in 25. Uh, yeah. It, it's just too excessive. There's too much here. Too much shit going on. Yeah. yeah so, but it's, Marty, it's, let me, uh, I'm, I'm, yes. let me, yeah, let me uh, pass it over to you. What do you uh, sorry, Craig, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no sweat. The, some of it is just, it's, it's just like, you know, it's like, Oh, oh, Paul Simon, you've gotten tired of, of doing folk songs. Let's do Graceland and just incorporate a bunch of exotic shit. And so there's a little, you mm -hmm. know, and Peter Gabriel did that and Sting did that. And, and, and many boring artists have done that. Um, and and good artists have done that. And and to me, this seems a little bit like that, like where it's like they're ex like it's they're exploring so much this wider canvas of bringing in all these classical instruments and all these like Middle Eastern scales and all these kind of exotic things. It's like. Yeah, but was there a song at the beginning of that? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I don't, and I think in a lot of cases there, there wasn't. Like this, it really, like this feels, like Nightfall Middle Earth is like a, like an incredible studio construction. Um, and Imagination from the Other Side, I think is, the, is their pinnacle artistically, but also still sounds like a band. Um, mm -hmm. This is more like Nightfall is a Middle Earth in terms of it's that construction, but they just, I feel it's just, they spent, they just spent it's so much time um, and, they, and it's like it almost like there's so much shit going on. It almost sounds like they were aware that the core ideas weren't that good. And so let's just keep piling on new harmonies and exotic things. And let's like let's kind of busy. Up. Like the they're probably given free reign because of the success. Probably yeah. so. Yeah. Free reign, yeah. creative, create free creative license. Which yeah. I like Charles's comment there, too, that, yeah, they, they kind of, you know, just because they could, they never stopped to think, you know, should we keep adding more stuff into this? Right. And uh, and yeah, to your comment too, Craig, about it starting to sound more like you know Hansi and some guys. You're, you're right. This is the album. You after this one, Thomas, you know, staunch left. Yeah. And you know he he didn't make many bones about the fact that he just he did not like the direction they had gone in. He it was oh, always good as the last two albums, but in particular Nightfall, he did not like the direction the band was going with this. They were focusing on the symphony and the bombast and kind of, you know, to some extent leaving, you know, the, you know, the core metal sound they'd had, you know, throughout the nineties behind. And thus he went off to form Savage Circus. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's the, the dude, the dude is, I think uh, like a really tasteful player, but he's a beast and a hard hitter. 
you would never know that listening to this album. And you actually wouldn't know it with Nightfall on Middle Earth, mm-hmm. as much as I love that album. Like that's he's getting crowded out. He's getting crowded yeah. out with some with like I mean, at that point, and this is something that sounds kind of like the modern journey sound or something like the loudest thing in the mix in a lot of these songs, like in the last two albums, are the are the are the kind of gang what, what harmony vocals, gang choir, whatever you want to call it. like that is the brightest thing. And like like the where the drum like on imaginations, the drums were still they're booming. They're huge and they sound great. There's yeah. a lot of power there. He has no power at all. I, like he doesn't have power in Nightfall Middle Earth. He's still playing great. And then this album was a one where it's like really if someone said told me it's like, you know, the whole thing's a drum machine, I'm like, okay. I wouldn't doubt it. Obviously, this guy can play all of this stuff, but it just doesn't it just doesn't have it it, it just doesn't have it. Jack, I, I see you like both albums, but man, somewhere in time is oops, sorry, one of my favorite maiden records. I love the atmosphere on that record. Um this to me is a lot more cluttered than that. I'll be back in just a minute, guys. Right on. Um well for me, this is my number nine. Um when it came out, like I said, there was a humongous media or uh PR push for it. Obviously, they got picked up by a different label or you know, obviously coming. Media? It was Century Media, I think. I don't know yeah, what the media. hell my version's on. It It doesn't appear to be a Century Media. Yeah. I mean, I remember getting the the the, the slip for it. And again, I think I reviewed it for Maniacs, but I remember getting the promo sleeve, which is not something you're getting for the import only. Yeah. And then it was like the two calls a week. You want to cover, you want to talk to Hansi from Blind Guardian? I'm like, no, I don't really. But anyway, I mean, this <laughs> album. Hansi, what happened to you? What happened to you? <laughs> Honestly, what? No, Bar- Barbara Ann. No, we've got Harvester of Sorrow this time. Ugh. The last time in the studio, Hansi. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for me, this album it aged a little bit better than when it came out for me. Um, though tracks like Age of False Innocence, Punishment Divine, and then there were Silence. There was Silence. There's a a loss in the punch in the in the metal punch that was found at the beginning leading up to this point um grandiose and at times bombastic compositions they initially feel very overbearing there's just way too much shit going on the production very polished it's almost too sterile that's another problem uh favorites i really like uh precious to jerusalem it's odd but it has a very effective chorus um and i also like at this point i mean this is kind of a german quality as well but you know blind guardian they're not afraid of advanced ballads they're not afraid to throw down on a a pretty ballad and um the maiden and the minstrel night the complexity with orchestration and involved guitar lines I, i dug it uh sadly sings destiny there's an oddly sleazy main riff uh gives the song an off kilter vibe until that soaring chorus hits with all of its glory. But those are my notes, basically, for this record. It's aged better for me than I thought it would. I, I haven't spun this one a lot either. This is one that, I, that is kind of like a revisiting here this week. Um, I didn't hate it, but it is. It's too much. It's too much going on. They needed to trim the fat on this for sure. Cut some of the the studio bloat out and the creative uh, masturbation that was going on. Again, if you want to make something this ambitious, uh, and they have, and they have succeeded, you just need better core hooks, and that's that's yeah. something like, like you know, like Alan said, he can look at these songs and songs he's heard many times, and like, what the hell happens in that one again? And and I have that, and I have that as well with this album. Like, yep. you know, it's also we're talking about all these other great Blind Guardian songs. I have like Bright Eyes and Last Candle and all these things like whirling around in my head at this point. But yeah, it's it, it's like you can get this ambitious. But you need to land somewhere, um, and and I just don't I don't feel it does. Another uh, live album to note that came out after this is uh well it's Bard's Tavern I think it's just called Blind Guardian Live but mm-hmm. this is also another really good live set it's a two CD set. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. great. Great tracks leading up to this album. It's fantastic. I don't think there's any uh, I don't think there's any uh, Night at the Opera songs on this actually. I don't think there are. I don't think there are. It's leading up to Nightfall and Middle Earth. 
What's it's the blocking? I, I, I've stayed away from because I saw Blind Guardian live and I was like, I'm glad I've seen them live. I can wear the shirt because I have that rule. If I wear the shirt, I need to have seen the band live. But, um, you know, I saw them live. I'm like, man, it's a ton of, it's, you know, the guy's playing with a click and they're piping in a bunch of pre-recorded vocals. So I didn't think like, oh, I should go, I should go out and get a live version of this pre-recorded vocals. It's like, I have enjoyed it. I'm not the world's biggest live fan either, but they they sound almost CD quality on here. Take right, that, are, take are that they, as you will. I, no, on that one and the other one, are the other guys singing like because I would like that's potentially a plus for me if the if 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 there are multiple other human beings who aren't Hanzi singing those other parts. Um, does that happen on those on those live albums? I couldn't tell you. It's been a while since I, I've spun them. Yeah, I don't think there is on Tokyo Tales, but the audience. It fills in, so he has the audience singing along with everything. I've heard his audience, and I like that. I like that audience. Singing. They're, 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 that audience is that audience is pretty good with pitch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This one, uh, it looks like there are two uh, "Night of the Opera" songs. "Under the Ice" is on here, and "Punishment Divine" is. They're both on disc two. I'm not seeing anything else from that album. Mm. Those aren't great choices, but yeah, those two. Those two are the uh, contribution from Night at the Opera on okay. the, the live two. But CDs. you can see that they're they're obviously they didn't feel confident in their new album either. They only have two songs <laughs> up against two CDs full of shit leading up to that. So yeah, and, no, and note they didn't take the they didn't take the the fifteen minute whopper. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not standing behind that, you know. I saw no. Maiden, I saw Maiden, you know, with, with with Hefe. I think it was in Boston when they were going out with Blaze and like you're getting you're getting that stuff. You're getting yeah. there. They, they were behind those songs. Uh, well, yeah, Austin. because Blaze couldn't hang with the Dickinson shit very well. It crushed yeah. him on a long tour. It crushed his vocals. Oh, I, oh, oh, absolutely. But you're also getting to hear a, a Wrath Child that doesn't sound like newer. With Blaze right. True. That <laughs> well, we're scrolling into uh, what's what year is this? Uh, Twist in the Myth, 2006 is the next album. Craig, 2006. So um, I'm going to be super short on this one. Um, this album is a, has a noticeably poppier sheen. Like it's crisper. Uh, the drums pop more. You're, they're mixing in. You're starting to get a little bit more of dance elements coming in. Uh, I, I rate this album 10. So I like it slightly more than Night at the Opera. And this is not the, ni the nicest thing to say. I mainly like it more because it's shorter. Um, they're both... Uh, I, I don't particularly care for this album. They're getting the scale down better. This album is like at this point, like this is a band that I think like in terms of like, say a comparison to Sabaton, I think they were edgier, much edgier than Sabaton before. At this point, you're, you're getting stuff that I think is, is as poppy, if not poppier than Sabaton, but with less good hooks. And um, so I think you're pretty much in, um, you're in that sort of terrain which so this album to me feels like pop music and it's going to come down pretty much a hundred percent to the hooks. It's got two total winners fly, which I was like, Oh, that's really good. And it has another stranger me. It's got two good pop songs. Those, both of those songs could be good Sabaton songs. Um, and uh, nothing else sticks with me on this album. I revisited it. Uh, it's altogether the it's because they're not, cluttering the mix with so many exotic instruments and there aren't so many um forays into exotic modes and keys uh it feel it's just more straightforward but it's just it it's just it's shorter uh the night at the opera which makes it it's crisper than night at the opera which makes it better and then the two so like fly and another stranger me i like those more than the two that i like on the previous album so um you know as i said this one ranks 10 I don't have much more to say about it. I, I don't. I don't think very much of this album. And I will say, after that came out, I was like, "Oh, a night at the opera wasn't a one-off. Like this band maybe has lost it." And because mm. it was kind of two in a row of albums that I again like this. The floor for this band is high because they're they're so creative and they've got such a good sound and they're they're never phoning it in. Not, that like the worst of these, the best, like nothing is ever phoned in. True. Uh, just like I was like, has the muse lost them? Are we going to be getting um, stuff like this where the best I can hope for is like basically like um, a Sabaton album, but not Corollas Rex, which is kicks the shit out of this, this thing. Um, but like one of the, let's say mid tier uh, Sabaton albums. So uh, again, I'm, I'm putting it number 10. I think it's okay. Like the previous album, two songs I like, 
but it's shorter and feels more focused. I got to thank you for getting me into uh, Sabaton. You sent me that Hero CD in one of your boxes. Man, I love that record. That thing is like pop metal perfection. Anyway. Corolla's Rex is the one with those guys, but sure. <laughs> Alan, you're up. A hmm. twist in the myth. Twist in the myth. I, uh, kind of the same reaction Craig had to this one, and I've actually got it ranked exactly the same spot, number 10. And I'm a little surprised it made it all the way to number 10. Um, <laughs> th this album was... And this is partly my fault. Uh, leading up to this album, I let my expectations it's run It's me, away. not you, Blind Guardian. That's it, bullshit. That's yeah, bullshit. No, wait, this, this one was a little bit me, at least, because, yes, uh, I, I was very hopeful that, okay, that maybe they had got... You know, the you know, got some you know things out of their system with Night of the Opera and could get back to making you know, a really solid you know, metal album, you know, get back to you know the imaginations, you know, pattern or get back you know to somewhere far beyond kind of material. And so I built this up in my head all wrong. I, I was really, really hyping this album in my head leading up to its release, you know, pre ordered it, got it, you know, right when it came out. And was crushed by this album. I hated this fucking thing when that came out. <laughs> it was like it was kind of the same thing you thought, Craig. It was just like that's now two in a row. This band is toast. Um, fuck, because it's going from being one of my favorite bands that could do no wrong, and you know, hey, one album doesn't quite work. Okay, that's going to happen. You, you get everybody gets one, but when you have two back to back, that seem like complete misfires oh now you're now you're starting to question things um, it's like the glory of the original star wars trilogy and then all the prequels <laughs> uh, that, that that sir is a topic for another stream entire, entirely it's like this is like blind guardians version of the prequels <laughs> Shit. So, I, I'm, molesting I, it, our child. It's already 11:30. I am not taking that to rabbit hole because uh, <laughs> that way lies madness, and uh, we'll be here until 6 a.m. Um, but yeah, I I was severely disappointed by this album when it came out. Yeah, uh, I stuck with it. I set it aside for a while. Let my tried to kind of recalibrate. It's like, okay, it's not imaginations from the other side. It's not somewhere far beyond. It's also not what they've done on the previous two albums. So I'm like, let me kind of recalibrate my expectations and go back to it, you know, a little bit later and see what I think of it. And yeah, it's helped a little bit. Um, you know, it could start to find some things here and there that I liked. It yes, it's not as overblown as opera. That's a good point. Um has a few songs that are good fly yeah it was one of the singles and it was kind of you know a fun song uh kind of quirky but cool another stranger me is good uh lion heart scald of shadow scalds and shadows i kind of like those two uh you know but that's four out of 11 and i'm stretching a little bit to get to four and that's there's just not quite enough there to put it together you know the, the joke that you know, at the end of the day with my in my head has always been you you play the first track it's called this will never end i'm just like yeah <laughs> it, it's it's just not it's not going to end for 51 fucking minutes yeah uh, i don't go back to this album this was the album that really convinced me i don't need to be a completist about blind guardian because <laughs> it, it stayed on my shelf for a long time and i'm just like i never play this record i don't want to play this record why do i own this record I own it because I own all the Blind Guardian albums. And I'm looking at the shelf and I was like, this is here. And that really funky collection that, uh, yeah, Craig showed earlier, you know, the Forgotten Tales is here. I'm just like, I'm never going to play these two CDs. They are literally just, they have mass and take up space. They basically are matter on my shelf, but they don't matter because I'll never play them. And so, yeah, that's what eventually broke the uh, broke the seal and uh, messed up my run of Blind Guardian CDs. And Night at the Opera followed them out the door pretty quickly, too, after that. So, again, now, like Craig is saying, too, it sounds like I'm shitting on the album a lot. It is not, at the end of the day, a horrible album. Uh, I, I like the way you phrased it tonight, Craig. You know, the floor on this band is still pretty high. It's a disappointing album to me because I hold their previous work in such high regard. Yeah. 
but this album doesn't stink. It's if not this was the stupid. only Blind Guardian album, I I would be giving it a thumbs up. If this yeah. were the if this were a yeah, let's well that's a good way to think about it, Marty. If this didn't have the name Blind Guardian on it, if this you know was you know uh, heroic dragon sword rhapsody fire or something, <laughs> I, I might give it you know like yeah okay I'd probably give it a thumb sideways. It it wouldn't blow me away, but it'd be like well you know it's a passable enough kind of european power metal thing they've got some interesting ideas i guess it's just yeah as a blind guardian album it doesn't live up to expectations so uh at the end of the day yeah it, it's going to rank pretty low not really that interested in it but the album is not a travesty of sound or anything like that either it's just not good by blind guardian standards so i'll rank it at 10 and uh marty i'm interested to hear where you are going to rank it that's number 11 for me Okay. Uh, out of 12 releases, this is number 11. I mean, overall, all the Blind Guardian elements are present. Like like we said, if this was the only Blind Guardian album ever came out, I'd probably like it a lot more. But when you have all this great stuff in front of it, it's hard to um, it's hard to to raise it up. But I mean, one of the reasons the songwriting falls flat for me as they start to embrace more of a rock and modern el- modern metal elements. Um. More life in the sound field. It's not as dense. There's like uh, as uh, Night of the Opera. Night of the Opera was such a dense mess. Um, so that was cool. But uh, more of a modern style in the and sound delivered by tight crunch riffs is found on the opener. This will never end. Um, guitars and more pro- are more pronounced on the album, which was cool. It was kind of cool to hear that. Uh, the synth orchestration and an orchestration is a bit too synthetic sounding. Do you guys notice that? It sounds like it's mm-hmm. somebody with a, a keyboard. It just sounded really. There, there's this. There's a little bit of a dance feel to the the production in general, yeah. which I feel is is that is that sort of thing. Like sometimes just sort of scooping out some frequencies and and and, and playing with it in, in a way. Like I I feel it was a little bit more, you know, dance dance club ready. The um. They step back a lot on the infinite layers, which we discussed. Um, lets the songs breathe more, but it offers less impact and um, it allows the weak parts of the songs to stand out more. I mean, you could tell the, the songs that maybe weren't their best ideas, it's way more noticeable with all this other shit not uh, draped on top of it. Uh, I really dislike the songs, Turn the Page, and... Um, Another Stranger Me. Other Land is another one I didn't care for. Good. Uh, Carry the Blessed Home. And This Will Never End were the two that stood out on this one for me. But yeah, it's an 11 for me. It's not ranking really high. But the next one, on the other hand, uh, and this is uh, At the Edge of Time, 2010. That's Craig Zoller. What are your thoughts on this one? Well, to speaking to Star Wars parlance, A New Hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, at this point, at this point, I was pretty much done because it's not like it, not done. Like I wouldn't check them out because obviously I did check them out. Um, but I I thought that they were just lost, and I I doubted that they were going to come back. I don't know what's the timing on this album. I have a repress of this because my uh, when did this album come out? This came out in 2010. 2010, so four years after uh, so, Twist. So, yep. But what well, four years? But here's the thing: twelve years since a good album. Yeah, and that, the, the albums are getting really spaced out. So that, so that, that's that's a key thing. Just in terms of me as a fan of this band, was um that amount of time is a really long time. And then, of course, there's the fear when they're taking that much time to put out their next releases, that it's like, oh, are they spending all of this time in the studio? Because then we're going to get a, like, a night at the opera, day at the races, like, you know, like all on top of each other. It's like, how bad is it going to get? A trip so, to the UCD bin? Yes. Yeah. Like, I, and, and, and so this, this album, um, uh, this thing came out and I've got a lot of good things to say about it. Uh, first off, it ranks five. For me in their in their catalog i think it's easily their best album over the new millennium um mm-hmm. their best post nightfall thing I, I i i think it's easily that uh i got a lot of compliments to to to, to give it my my chop 
because I think that this album actually um, uh, would have the potential to be like maybe number number three or four because I think the highs are really high. Uh, is is it is top heavy in a serious way, and not so much like just the first half, but it's the last three songs. And there are a couple of albums that I just lament they go this way. There's like when Journey was a was a crazy good jam band with Ainsley Dunbar, maybe the best rock drummer in history. Uh, and they have an album called Don't Look at, uh, or Look Into the Future. There's just a point at which that album just stops being good. And it's not bad, but it's just not good for the rest of it. And the, the worst example of this for me is MSG's Assault Attack, which the first, I think it's five songs on that album, the fifth one being Desert Song, Hall of Fame. Desert Song, one of the best songs ever recorded. And then you get the last three songs on that album. And um, those last three songs are just like, none of them are bad, but they're operating at like, they're all kind of pretty good. And it's coming off of Desert Song, one of the greatest songs ever recorded of all time. Graham Bonnet at his best, Michael Shanker at his best, which is as good as singing and guitar playing can get. So that's what happens to this album. And there's a reason that I think this is a good album and not a great album is because those last three songs to me are a big step down. But uh, one of the things I have got it like, and I really, I spent a lot of time with this returning to this. This was like the the real nice finds of like revisiting all of the material for, for this. One was, you know, Alan's like going on and on about Tales from a Twilight War. I'm like, yeah, that thing is legitimately great. And the other was, was this one, which I always remember like, oh, this was the return to form. But Sacred Worlds, the thing about that song, they did it. This is the song where they in, where they integrated orchestral elements and it worked. Yep. Like they try it at other times and it doesn't work. This is the one when you get to that chorus and the and the strings are like, whoop, 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 and it's all of those kind of scissoring things under that gigantic chorus. It, it's like this feels gigantic. Like this is something that actually feels bigger than Nightfall in Middle Earth using orchestral elements. And they they like they found the mix and it feels like a real orchestra. I'm a, I assume it is a real orchestra. Um, but like that lands, like that song is really good. Uh, and is, I think, like if you want to show, like if, if, if you were trying to convince a person who's really into classical music that it has a place in heavy metal, um, this is a real good example of that. Like better than better than almost any I can think of. So that's a real strong start out. You get Tanner Lorne, which is prove we're tough. So they prove that they're tough. Um, they prove that they're tough with a bunch of, like, for whatever reason, this song just seems very Gamma Ray, like the, the riffs in it. Um, you got a strong chorus. You got an okay verse. Um, I enjoy the tune. Uh, wrote a no release. Um, ah, this, is, this, is, this is really, this is really enjoyable tune. Uh, particularly well-phrased verses. And which sometimes he doesn't pay as much attention to as the chorus, but really, really nice stuff. Ride into obsession. Marty's gonna really like that one because that's a that's a <laughs> rolling. I have eight. it on my I have it on my notes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're gonna. At the call and answer of the verse of that is really very. It's just excellent. Um, the um, yeah, there's and, and some of the detours, some of the musical interludes in this. I was like, oh, these are a little bit better than a lot of the stuff where it just sounds like they're going to kind of like leprechaun village and it's a lot of weird like really kind of happy happy stuff that one that one is really pretty strong um uh what do we got next uh curse my name uh that's okay that's definitely the weak link for me of this initial initial uh this initial bunch and then we get and this was the song so when i heard this the first time i was like oh this thing sounds better and then we get what is absolutely irrefutably the best song they've done this millennium, Valkyries. This thing is absolutely glorious. That like it, the the arrangement of the drum parts, the when the battle is like all of that, all of that stuff, all the key changes, the post the post um, chorus twin guitar leads. The the solo is like amongst the tastiest you've gotten from Ulbrich. The drumming is fantastic. This is what's this guy's name? It's like. It's a, it's Frederick Enke or Ekne, something like that. MK. Um, this is his shining moment. Like this feels like the the great stuff that that Stouch was doing on Imaginations from the Other Side. Just really, there was all the space for like the cascading fills 
Um, I just think the bridge is great. The chorus is great. Um, the space is there. The uh, It's fantastic. Um, uh, we get um, uh, Control the Divine, uh, a solid, you know, a solid up-tempo thing. And then you get the last three, um, which is the the like the war of thorns has some kind of major key part i don't i don't love voice in the dark we are tough and they show it uh okay uh yeah i mean it's it, it, it seems designed for the purpose to show we are tough and uh but it's i just don't think it's what this band has ever done best so like there aren't many songs in this millennium that could have potentially gone on battalions of fear this one probably could have Albeit it's better played here, uh, and I think it's decent. Like Warthorn, I think I think it's a decent tune, um, but not not a very good one. Um, and then you get Wheel of Time, which uh, I think is is the kind of song where it's like the chorus is grand, it's glorious, it works, it lands for me. A lot of the stuff in between is sort of pretty good to okay. So I feel this is a song. Legitimately, I'm just waiting for the chorus. But it lands. I mean, that chorus is monstrous. And again, using the orchestral stuff better than they did. And here to go on a brief um, fantasy tangent, the mel so I read only one book from Wheel of Time. That was enough for me. And uh, and I was like, man, is this derivative of Lord of the Rings? And at some point in the Robert Jordan book, some character says every story is just the same story, story retold. And I thought, is this Robert Jordan making an excuse for plagiarism? But <laughs> reading, re listening to this song, there's a melody that is the... Uh oh, here we go. Dissension among the ranks. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no. If, if, when he follows that up, you'll, you'll, you'll see. But... Oh. <laughs> They take a melody from Into the Storm that let me see it, precious treasure. So he sticks something from Lord of the Rings into this song. So uh, perhaps it's it's a callback. I don't know if that series ever developed into a point where it said, like, where it became more original or turned into an outright um, just homage. But it was just kind of a cool little thing. I was like, oh, they took a Nightfall of Middle Earth melody and stuck it in here. It's a sung melody on Nightfall of Middle Earth. Here it's a guitar melody in Wheel of Time. They're calling back to Tolkien, which I thought, you know, from the one Robert Jordan, you know, Wheel of Time book I read, I was like, oh, this is completely just called back to Tolkien. So anyways, I think that that tune is like a fine tune that's like kind of fills the fills spaces with like exotic stuff, trip to the hookah bar or whatever it is. And then eventually lands with this colossal chorus that is absolutely good enough to wait for. So I think you have an album that, like, if this album had Control the Divine and then had one other awesome song, I would probably like this more than Somewhere Far Beyond. This would probably rank number four for me. Um, but as it does, it ranks number five, so it's not much further down. It's just a little bit bittersweet because I always know, like, uh, the 20 minutes at the end isn't as good as the rest of this. Not bad. Um, I mean, War of Thorns and Curse My Name are kind of the only two that I, I would I would flush. Um, but nothing is bad on here. And this was a real, this was really nice. It's also just nice to see them completely succeed with their orchestral ambitions, which wasn't and will not always be the case. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alan. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, well, Craig and I still see... I, I own a lot of this. It's their best album of the 21st century, which at this point means it's their best album in 24 years, almost a quarter of a century. So uh, yeah, time flies when you're having fun, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got it ranked six. Um, and while I do like the album and I think, yeah, it's better than other stuff for me, there is a very clear break between my top five and this album, this album will not push its way into the top five uh, ahead of anything else. But yeah, now this album I came into with very few expectations. It was, again, similar to Craig, yeah, a, after two albums that were sort of letdowns, uh, you wait another four years and it's like, oh, this band is still around. They are going to make another album. Well, okay, let's, here's my money. Please don't hurt me. Uh, Oh, it's actually pretty good this time. It was a kind of a return to form. 
So it was a very pleasant surprise that, okay, they, they've got some ideas and things are flowing better again here. For me, this isn't an album with a ton of standout tracks. You know, song by song, it's kind of like a lot of it's like, oh, that's okay. That one's good. That one's pretty good. But it's just the fact that they, yes, got a little bit more back to basics and just putting together good songs on a consistent basis through most of the album. Um, I do like Curse My Name. You know, while it's simple, uh, again, it shows that, okay, yes, we, what are some of the things we used to do well? Well, let's redo some of those. Uh, Curse My Name, that's the kind of thing that, yes, you could have found on one of their 90s albums. And um, yeah, it still works. It's still fun here. Um, and you find that, you know, through some other the other tracks too. Uh, the Wheel of Time one, yes, great chorus, but there's a lot of stuff in between the chorus that never really sticks with me. And I'm, uh, yeah, I never got into the Jordan books whatsoever. So that one I have no big connection to. But again, it was nice to see them go back to let's pick another popular sci fi fantasy series and, you know, give it the treatment like we used to do for Dune and Blade Runner and stuff before we kind of got a little off track somewhat with the past couple of albums. So it's a good listen. It's not one I take out to play a lot because there are five albums ahead of it that I like, you know, definitely a step better. So I've got to have a reason to want to play this particular Blind Guardian album, but it is a good album. Gets a thumb up and it showed that the band, there was still life in the band, that they weren't just going to completely wander off into the wilds and do stuff that was uninteresting. Although we'll find out later, they might have wandered <laughs> off into those woods after all. Um, uh, we're not, we're not there quite yet. Poor yeah. It, it's uh, a, <laughs> yeah, it, it is a very good, very solid blind guarding album. And it was nice. It was definitely needed at the time to kind of, give fans something to cling to who didn't get into the past two albums. And it's worth saying, and some folks in the you know chat have been, you know, pretty big on like night at the opera. There are a lot of fans that do enjoy twist and opera. And that's absolutely fine. If folks dig those albums. So it's not like the fan base had completely abandoned them over these past two albums. They were still going strong. They were still touring a lot. They were a European power metal band that was consistently touring in the U S this whole time. Um, you know, my wife and I saw them twice. We saw them once on the Twist Tour, and the other one may have been actually the Edge of Time Tour. And, you know, always fun to see live, always sound fantastic. So it, they were still going quite strong. Uh, but this sound just proved that, yes, they could come up with some new ideas that were enjoyable. But did you, you did, did you feel relief, like, oh, they've returned? Because it was like 12 yes. years. And that's the thing. Yes. Oh, it's three albums, late, but it's 12 years. That's a lot of time. Yes. The, the spacing on their albums, when you get into the 21st century, it gets very annoying that, yes, you waited you, you waited three years for a follow-up to Nightfall. It's like, okay, you, that was a successful album. You toured a lot. Uh, so if, actually, I guess you waited four years for that follow-up. Uh, but yeah, you know, you had a lot going on. You were suddenly a big thing. Okay, you took your time. But then you wait another four years first please give me something that's not nightfall i not night at the opera and then you wait another four years for something that's not going to disappoint like twist in the myth so yeah these big steps in between albums were not helping especially when you know from the late 80s to the early 90s it cranked them out 88 89 90 92 95 96 or sorry 98 uh, yeah. yeah waiting for a blind guardian album to come out sort of became an event you you had to wait for it and when it's uh, let down, oh, that really hurts because, you know, it's yeah. going to be a long time before you get another shot at it. And so, yeah, th this album was kind of a relief. It's just like, yay, good Blind Guardian album. This this, yeah. this I needed. Yeah. yeah. But what do you think about it, Marty? This is my number four. I really okay. like this album. It um, They dropped the rock experimentation, the pop rock experimentation, which really brought them back on track. Production feels more uh, settled with the metal and symphonic elements blending in a more organic way. 
the orchestration i did not look is it real musicians it sounds like it, it is, is the, it, uh it's the Prague film philharmonic yeah no that that yeah that first one that's gotta be real yeah, or they come yeah. off the album before with these super synthy shitty orchestration moments and now is all of a sudden you could tell it sounds like a, a real orchestra playing um favorite songs on here um sacred worlds huge orchestral buildup uh, when the metal hits, it delivers with smart vocal melodies and varying intensities in the composition. Very yeah, Mark, bomb. What's that? Have you? Can you think offhand of another metal song that integrates like full symphonic orchestra as well as that one? There might be. There, there's probably something. I just can't. Like it really works on that song. They do on the next album. Uh, the never. Uh, the ninth wave. The beginning of this album starts off the exact same fucking way as this album does. It's kind of creepy. Anyway, uh, no, I can't though. But that is an amazing combination between the yeah. two. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. into the void. Aggressive riffing calls back to a speed metal feel. I once again like Blind Guardian's effortless and alternating. Um, all for, all, I'm sorry. Effortless alternating between sharp, heavy moments into more fragile segments. Um, Hansi is perfectly calibrated for this playful uh, vocal exercise. Uh, Ride to Obsession, again, with more energetic riffing, maintaining this slight speed metal influence and technical proficiency, hails the band's early years and what remains in their heart for that style. Control the Divine, such a great and atypical chorus, thanks to a powerful vocal melody. Um, I've got really my least favorite on this was road of no release, but it's not a dislike. I mean, there, this album is my fourth, fourth favorite at this point. I'm, this is one of the albums of theirs. that's really late to my collection. Um, I think two years ago we're, we're out in the woods camping and a friend put it on. I'm like, God, this is really good. I don't own this. Like, yeah, this is a great blind guardian album. And he's right. It's absolutely a fantastic blind guardian. I love it. My fourth, uh, which leads us to um, 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 uh, Beyond the Red Mirror 2015. So now we this... have to wait five years for another album. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So here I've got this, whatever this digi. Oh, or, yeah, yeah. Okay. Digi or whatever. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, I, I like this album. Um, I, I, I put this I put this as, as seven um, on on my list. This one is a little bit harder for me to recall. I feel like it's it's to me surprising that this is the album that came out, and I and I had it wrong in my mind, and I went and I looked probably on Rate Your Music or, or Metal Archives. I it, 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 in terms of this feels closer to the Night at the Opera kind of stuff, uh, and 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 this is the one that for whatever reason kind of fell through the cracks for me. I think I had it and just sort of forgot about it and and, and when I was going through it again I was like, "Oh yeah, this one." And it's got it's got good stuff. Um I think most of the songs this is getting a little bit more back I feel back more into a little bit like the exotic modes in terms of like keys and stuff like that. And I I, en I enjoy this, but it's for me a definite step down from the previous one. Um so the album begins, you're beginning with all this orchestral stuff. You have like the Gregorian chant and everything is going. And then the drums start. And you know how many heavy metal albums have like the drums start and they're really super quiet in the background. And, or you hear like a scratchy record and they're really quiet in the background and then boom. And then you hear like the full, the full field mix at like full volume. That's, that's always, when I listen to this album, I always feel like I'm waiting for the drums to kick in. And it, I'm going to get to the end of the album and it has never happened. It feels like the whole album, they're kind of, they're pushed back. They're pushed back there. Um, the, uh, like I made the comparison to sort of the Arnel Pineda era journey. I think the chorus of ninth wave is that it's, it, it's, it's enjoyable. It's let me interrupt uh, you right here. You've mentioned journey and blind guardian context like five times. Would you consider blind guardian to be kind of like a journey adjacent metal band? I, I, I do not. I mean, there's a soaring, there's a soaring aspect to it, but it, it is just something like with, with the overtly, I guess I don't listen to a lot of stuff in the rock context where I think the choruses are quite this poppy. And so when they, when they land, it's sort of landing to me in, in that, in that space when they, um, when they, when they're doing more like, I guess the Sabaton 
Rhapsody thing. Obviously, like Sabaton is a band where I like a good chunk of their music and Rhapsody isn't. So I don't know most of it. Maybe they have some albums I would enjoy. But uh, it's just... Interrupt you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, it's, more, it's more just it's reminding me of that context of like that overtly commercial, very accessible. First time you hear it, you'll kind of remember it sort of thing. But anyways, I enjoy that tune, Twilight, uh, Twilight of the Gods. Uh, I, I enjoy... This is another one where I feel like some of the kind of the jagged riffs that are sort of thrown in there are a little bit in the Dragon Force um, video game sort of sort of style. And I also bring up the Journey comparison because I think both bands mix the backing vocals too loud. Um, and it sort of overpowers everything. Um, uh, the Prophecy song, there's like, there's a cool line in there that like, a, whatever, a crow, a storm, whatever. Like, it has a good line. It's sort of... Uh, whatever. Uh, at the edge of time, I enjoy, uh, for the most part, um, Ashes of Eternity, no. You got a naughty boy riff in there. You got, <laughs> no. You got Saints come marching in is happening in this thing. Ashes of Eternity is just embarrassment. Like, I, like, get this, this is, this is like Tommy Knocker stuff. This is, this is pretty low. Like, Obviously, I'm not a fan of Night of the Opera, or Twist in the Myth, but I don't think they're. I don't think they have any that are quite that. Um, the Distant Memories is good. Uh, that that's that's a highlight for me. The verses are really somber, um, and the orchestra is well used. I think this is probably their second best outside of the opener on the previous album. Um, what about what the? Yeah, the Holy Grail. We are tough. They're showing it. I'm not buying it. Um, the throne is pretty decent. I'm hearing more Richie Blackmore in this song than, than most, but I enjoy the chorus. But this is one of these things, sort of like in, in a way, sort of like a Night at the Opera song. Like I remember parts of it. I've heard this album, however many times, not a ton, but um, it's it's it really is like the chorus sticks with me, and then the rest kind of like we, maybe like the Wheel of Time song, and then there's a bunch of other stuff in between. Uh, and that's sort of where where the throne lands for me. Uh, and then we get uh, Sacred Mind, which is, um, I like the intro. This has the quality. At this point, like, you know, we haven't talked much about Demons and Wizards, and, you know, we don't need to add new albums to talk about. But this has a bit the quality of Beneath the Waves, which is one of my favorite uh, Demons and Wizards songs, that sort of somber thing. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a, it's it's fine enough. Like the rising action on the chorus is pretty cool. I, it, like it, it bugged me until I figured out what it what it was. Um, this ending, da -da -ba 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 -da, this end, the ending of this song is the ending of Battery. I don't know why they, they just do Battery. Ba -da 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 -da. And they they change. They do they, instead of changing the. I think the last two chords are playing the same one instead of going down or whatever it is. Like there's one like note. There's one spacing difference that makes it not exactly battery, but I'm like, dude, this song so does not deserve the battery ending. This is like we're they're trying to prove it, but it's it it so doesn't deserve the ending of battery. <laughs> uh, Grand 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 Parade is 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 trash. Grand Grand, Grand Parade is <laughs> it's like Trans Siberian Orchestra with leprechauns and just shit. I don't want to hear that that. that album. <laughs> That, that 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 song is that song is a is a is a low point, and um, it's just all schmaltz. It's like ten minutes of I don't want this. Please stop it. Um, <laughs> that's, that's that's where that one lands. But you know, like this. So uh, unfortunately, that that's I I would I would rather an album that has weak tracks for those not to be near the end. I would always rather a bottom heavy album than a top one, but. Uh, this one, this one ends ends with that thing. I mean, I, at least they didn't put like the end of Damage Incorporated on on that. <laughs> yep. So, anyways, uh, so I but oh, overall, I enjoy I enjoy the album. It just, like you know, obviously my opinions of it got worse as it went on, and that's sort of what the listening experience is for me, particularly that that closer that I don't I don't ever need to hear again. All right, Alan. Point of contention, trans. I think is contractually obligated to use holiday elves instead of leprechauns. So oh, okay. we, we can't mix and match, you know, our diminutive, you know, persons races here. Uh, <laughs> Got to get that straight out. So. Demi humans, please take no offense. 
<laughs> if they if if Trans Siberian Orchestra starts writing you um you know, St. Patrick's Day albums, then 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 they will flood the stage with leprechauns, no doubt. I hope the drows on Twitter don't come after us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, hey, you know, if they do an R.A. Salvatore uh, themed song sometime, we'll right. have plenty of drow involved. I'm down with that. I've read yeah. like 13 of his fucking books. You know. I read a ton of those back in the yeah. day. Yep, that's going to be it's going to be difficult getting getting a good musical phrase out of Driz Dorden. Yeah, you, you got it. <laughs> Dorden, does, if they try to rhyme it with Lederhosen, I am so out of here. <laughs> Ex- Hell Z's of Driz is going to be problems in and of itself. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Alan. What All do you right. feel about the red beyond the red mirror? Uh I this one. I, I rank it 11, so it's down there Me too. the bottom here. Um, <laughs> no, wait, no. I did not. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, it is not a terrible Pretty album. Blank, Blank Orion just doesn't do terrible albums, which is to their credit. But uh, this album, a couple of things about it, it snuck up on me when it came out. You know, you wait five years for something, you're going to take your eye off that ball sooner or later. So... Yeah, I, w- I remember I'm browsing Amazon one day and this Blind Guardian pops up. I'm like, huh, is that a live album, collection of stuff? New studio album? Right. What the hell you say? And she, so I'm like, okay, the last one was good. So maybe this one's good too. You know, and, you know, poked around about it a little bit. Supposedly this one is conceptually tied into imaginations from the other side somehow. And so I'm like, oh, well, that's promising. So, yeah, let's go ahead and order this puppy and find out what we've got. Oh, 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 we've got a lot of, we got, we got a lot of big sym- symphonic. The, the, the bloat is starting up again on this album a bit. Um, yeah. And that's not the direction I want him to go back into. It's just like, you, you were there, you did that, you were, you were moving in the right direction, and now you're moving back in the other direction, and that's not where I wanted you to go. Um so yeah, this is one I got. I played a couple of times, and I shelved it real quick. Uh, I just did not want to slog my way through sixty-five minutes of this, you know, kind of bombast at that point in time. Um, I so said this one was yeah, twenty fifteen. Yeah, at the that time too, I was not. I'm trying to think, just in terms of musical taste, I may have been on one of those cycles where I wasn't playing as much power metal in the first place, which didn't help. Um, you know, I've come back to this album a few times, revisited it. Yeah. You know, and it's better than the first impressions. So, um, but there's still not a ton on here that I gravitate to. When I play this album, it feels a little bit like a chore to get through the track list. Um, there's nothing on here that I would necessarily take and want to put on like my personal blind guardian best of mix. I could just skip this album and not feature it. Uh, the ninth wave is a good song. The, the ninth wave is the one I, I kind of wish maybe it was placed somewhere else in the running order. While I like the song, I don't know. I feel like by the time I get to the end of it, I'm already you know ready for you know a pee break or something. It's like, Okay, got through. That song's pretty good, but um, I'm going to hit the pause button and uh, go feed the cats or ch- ch- check on the dishes or something. And then I'll come back and tackle the rest of this thing. Good song, but yeah, having it you know, as the nine-minute opener, uh, you know, it, it's setting you up for a long listen, even though it is a good, you know, a pretty good track. After that one, I'm hard pick, hard pressed to pick one that I think is really good. So the album overall, it's not bad. This is a kind of album, you know, if I'm grading it, it's going to be right there in the middle somewhere. It's going to be like a C, maybe a C minus, because it never has quite clicked for me. So it's still not below average, but um, for a Blind Guardian album, this is not the one I'm going to listen to. I'm sure someday I'll break it out and give it a few more spins. Maybe it'll start to click a bit better, but... This was the band heading back in the exact opposite direction of where I wanted them to be. So that always just left them bad taste. And I have never figured out what the hell it's supposed to have to do with imaginations from the other side. I don't know 
I never found that conceptual connection that supposedly exists. So maybe, maybe I just got to dig even deeper into it for that. We'll, we'll, uh, maybe we'll report back in a couple of years with an update and, uh, it, it'll all make sense then. But for now I got to rank at 11th. Okay. Uh, for me, it's number 10. Um, I felt it started damn near exact to the um, edge of time. The long orchestral buildup into metal orchestral hybrid song um, on the ninth wave, which is one of my favorite songs on the album. A uh, good song, but there's less of a heavy edge, which could be due to less bite in the guitar production. Um, catchy, though brief chorus. Twilight of the Gods, the song, solid, advanced, nuanced, yet predictable, uh, which is Blind Guardian has a very has very much started to exploit their formula at this point. Uh, they're leaning heavy into their formula. Granted, it's a good formula, but if you're you know quite accustomed to their sound, it might be a bit tough to get through. Holy Grail, more upbeat track. Um, very welcomed at this point because there's a lot of sameness going on it's again if this was the only blind guardian album ever i would have probably ranked it a lot higher obviously but um with the stuff that came before it, it's just it's just kind of rough but if that leads us into um 2019's legacy of the dark lands twilight orchestra ah see i don't actually own a copy of this and My feeling is roughly 100% of people who own this are blind guardian completists. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and rather than people who own it by choice. So this is my number 12. I'm not going to go. There's not really like, certainly I'm not going track by track. Um, I can say this. <laughs> the, number, the, number, the number one thing when, when we discuss this, I'm like, oh shit, I got to listen to that orchestra thing again. So, <laughs> uh, so I like some classical music. I've, into the symphony I, I i am an opera fan um this is classical music like that seems to have like like lands in the like late 1700s early 1800s like if you're going to do classical music in a contemporary context you know um and not even contemporary like mazorsky so that's a favorite composer of mine i like stravinsky um i like goreski in terms of a dude in, in the 20th century so there are people who are doing really interesting things with harmony and creating darkness. I feel like the darkness on this album is like spooky town horror, like houses <laughs> for children, and and kind of so the entire time it feels like um, really like this weird mix of like obviously it's not really metal, and there are a couple of tunes that I enjoy, um, the great ordeal, uh, whatever. Try, uh, treason is pretty good um but essentially they're doing like a movie score that's like extremely heavy-handed and and i find in general movie scores are extremely extremely uh heavy-handed so here it's like the whole thing is that you get some good hansi singing uh this would be that probably the most egregious example of like dude get a bunch of other singers who have different voices if you're gonna do this if you're gonna go full on not even rock opera not even rock opera basically opera 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 you're gonna go do that like you need a bunch of other people doing those things and not just the spoken word that leads into they were the metal kings not even just that <laughs> but like have other singers singing opposite bring in your own land bring in that dude he could come he, like Rule. yeah like <laughs> like like invite your you know like you probably met rob halford invite him eric adams come along like bring in a bunch of other titans and sing opposite them and make drama unfold yeah. um, which is my biggest problem with like and again like i don't know the story of what's going on with might fall in middle earth but like when people get into the conceptual stuff um, in, in like long concept albums with metal they tend not to have the drama unfold in the song they tend to describe the drama so it's the, it's always this third person removed perspective on the drama. So if you want to make this album and make this thing work, get a bunch of other awesome singers, get men, get women, like load it up with a bunch of diverse voices and characters and go at it. Um, but what this is, is, is like, is it is like, sounds like Hanzi insane in a locked in a room, multi-tracking um, orchestra, like, and then the orchestra just sounds like 
kind of children's show fantasy, children's show horror, children's show, like it's very, very light. Um, and considering like you have more interesting and um, oppressive and atmospheric harmonies happening literally a hundred years ago in the classical field, why you're getting something that's so this like, like kind of Renaissance fair uh, approach. It just seems very, very light. So obviously this is number 12. This is, this is the, this was the, I was like, Oh, I got to listen to that thing again. And it's not terrible. And I'll say like, I've said that like my least favorite album by them, they've just made something I don't want to hear. It's like there's the Droot album um, where they do their other songs in acoustic guitars. And at the time when I used to be a completist with Droot, which was at a time when all their albums were really good. I had that one. I think I've since dumped it. And it's like, I don't need to hear, like, the original songs are incredible. And so with this thing, it's like, if you're going to embrace a classical thing, you've got to go. If you want to make an opera, make an opera. Don't basically do a Blind Guardian thing where you're placing riffs and drums with, like, giant major key movie score, very obvious melody. So it's just, I could, I, you know, like I said, like, I think the thing is just completely average. There's a lot of work that went into it. But I can also just say, this isn't for me. Like the description of this isn't for me. If you're going to make an opera, you need a bunch of different voices and you need the yep. drop to unfold in the context of the song, not just describing a bunch of shit that happened and then have the drama unfold in the recitative spoken spoken word parts. Which they could have took a few notes from, you know, Avantasia on this whole thing because mm -hmm. that's a guy that does that. You know, he brings a bunch of the best vocalists ever in power metal and pins them against each other in these characters and shit. And it could have happened on this album too. Let's go to Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds with Phil Linnett stealing the show as the crazy old priest. And you get what's his name from the Moody Blues. Like there are ways like this has been done and it has been done successfully. Certainly yep. like the first Alan Parsons project album. We got voices and characters all over the place. So yeah. it can be done, but it's like what you have is like a really super light classical that seems informed by classical that was dated 200 years ago, doesn't have atmosphere. And then the opera aspect is like almost, it feels like it's almost entirely Hanzi. I know there are other singers on there, but he is the, he, he feels like he's 95% of the singing voices. So that, that, that one clearly the bottom end for me. And um, yeah, no, thank you. All right, Alan. Um, this one fulfills a prophecy Craig made a couple of hours ago where it, it finally is just, Hansi and some people making music. Uh, Hansi's the only member of Blind Guardian that actually performs on this. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, the, the other guys, um, they're, they, they, they're doing something. Don't know what. Hanging but, out. So. But Ulbrich wrote some of it, I believe, or I thought he did. I He might have had a hand in the writing. Let me see if I can find anything on it real quick. I thought uh, he, he didn't perform still. on it, but let's see. Does he have any writing credits? Uh, guest members. Of this is them stalling for the next album. This is all it is. It's just a. Ah, if there's too much thing. work here for this it's to be. Stop gap. It's it's just it's just it it, it, it isn't what I want. Olbrich does have some song right. He has a producer, lyric, and songwriting credit. Okay. So uh, he does have his finger somewhere in this pie. Um. Yeah, this isn't this. I'm um, number 12 for me, not even close. Um, this was another one I had no idea it was coming out, and I remember very distinctly I found it just we were at the mall. I'm in FYE, it's on like the new release shelf. I'm like, oh, there's a new Blind Guardian. Okay, wasn't too keen on that last one. I picked this one up and look at it for a minute. And <laughs> this is why technology is a good thing, folks, because I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking. This is setting off every warning bell in my Something suspicious. Head. <laughs> let's um, let's take out the smartphone, connect to the interwebs. Let's check this puppy out before I carry it up to the cash register. So I'm standing there in the store for you know several minutes, kind of you know, okay, click click click. Oh hell's no, you ain't getting my thirteen ninety nine. Put that bitch right back where I found it and leave the store. Uh, maybe I bought something else. I don't remember. I did not buy this, uh, and I'm not going to buy this. Um, is it terrible? No. Now, uh, again, is, is this you know a crap fest of an album? 
No. Could it be enjoyable enough background music if I just wanted some, you know, non-metal, generic, classical sounding stuff to hear Hansi sing? Sure, I like Hansi's voice. He's a good vocalist. Ah, uh, but that's all it is. It's Blind Guardian, and we've seen signs of it, you know, for you know for decades. And you know, they finally just they throw all the metal stuff out the window, and they just latch onto that orchestral symphonic side. And they just go full in on it. Um, really do wish they had just put it out under the name. And looking at it, I kept thinking, is the, why didn't they just put this out under the name Twilight Symphony and call the album Legacy of the Dark Lands? And it could have just been a Hansi Kirsch, you know, side project and Ulrich could, you know, write and help him out with it. But this didn't really need the Blind Guardian logo at the top of it. it just my, 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 guess is, my guess is this is the, this is the reason. It's the same reason that Circus Maximus became a Manila Road album and, and Seven Jethro Star became a Black Sabbath it, album. It, it, and A became a Jethro Tull album. It's because it's yep. like, here's something that sells. And, and, yeah, and the, up the... Uh, to make oh. there's no doubt that this thing costs money to make yeah whatever the uh oh shit always forget the one that was supposed to be mustaine's solo album and ended up being a mega oh, md45 md45 the system the system no. has failed the system, system has failed. failed yeah yeah that was supposed to be Mustaine. oh oh i, I didn't know that he was that was supposed to be a mm -hmm. mustaine solo album yeah yeah uh chris poland and everyone everyone is just credited as guest musician on that except for uh except for mustaine anyway um uh, yeah, I have no interest in listening to this album. I went back and played it again. You, know, I, I did eventually, of course, sit down and play the whole thing online. Uh, and yes, all my worst fears were kind of bore out. I've this week was the first time I'd gone back and played it since. And yeah, it's just not what I want to listen to, uh, especially not if I'm in the mood for Blind Guardian. I'm not going to go pull this off. This is them, you know. They, they've taken the night at the opera. Now they're spending, you know, the whole fucking weekend at the opera. Their whole vacations at the opera. They're, they're spending <laughs> summer camp at the opera with us. They brought album. the kids. <laughs> they, they, they no, they didn't. They left all the kids at home. It's Hansi's summer camp at the opera. The whole season, he'll be there and uh, have fun with it. Again, mu musically, I'm not going to say it's terrible or anything, but it's just not at all what I want to hear from uh, from a Blind Guardian album. So, number twelve with a bullet. Um, <laughs> you, know, hey, you kept Red Mirror and Twist from the Myth from uh, being bottom of the barrel, so you accomplished something, Twilight Symphony. <laughs> there you go. All right, Marty, I'm, I'm guessing you've probably got it down here too. Twelve, to for sure. Um, this to me is a brand not a band, but a brand effortlessly embracing their pretentious side. Mm. Uh, the soundtrack to Disney's Fantasia to the dark land boogaloo <laughs> <laughs> with Hansi doing a lot of singing. I mean, I don't need to own two full discs of blind guardian sniffing their own farts and finding the bouquet exhilarating. Okay. <laughs> and that's what this is. It's blind guardian sans metal. I can see the discussion about a year after in the band room saying guys i'm sorry i just i thought my vision would really have sold better than this so sorry um but what did it do it put it in put the band back in line for uh, 2022's the god machine it's not fantasia 2 darkland boogaloo but what do you think about uh the god machine s craig zoller I enjoy it. Uh, I mean, to me, there are two albums this millennium by this band that I could just tell someone who likes the superior stuff from the from the, the 90s to say, go get those. You'll enjoy them. This is the other one. Um, At the Edge of Time has much higher highs, is much more memorable, um, but also to me has 20 minutes at the end that isn't as good as whatever the 35, 40 minutes that preceded it. Um, You know, the hype on this was 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 pretty significant. Uh, the cover is striking. We haven't talked much about cover art, but there's a kind of a sameness of like dark with some sort of like, I swear these covers really look similar. All of their out, like a lot of these album cover, not, not, not night of the opera and, and uh, nightfall, they differentiate, but a lot of them, yeah. it's like some sort of like ornate um, Wayne's cutting and such. And well, I mean, this is like a, a, a standard movie promo poster, red right. with blue, and yeah, you know, not, and then you got not, the 
the yellow and green. And yeah, I mean, there's like primary colors lumped together, which is very attractive to the eye in marketing. You know, yeah, I find them like that, uh, the, like the, the, whatever the lost tales thing that came out around the same time, like looks like imagination from the other side. Like so many of these really look similar, except for some yeah. of these group shots. In any case, not worth getting much into in, in so far as I bring it, I bring it up because this cover was striking. Like it this is, is I saw it once and I remembered it and it didn't look like any of their other covers. And it's not that they have to make them all, make them all different, but that was, it was nice. Um, obviously, um, this album, you know, I talked about Carcass. They made Surgical Seal to prove they're tough. And some of these other, uh, some of these songs on these albums are, are proving the same thing. This album is definitely that. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's like, this is their most aggressive thing. I'm trying to like, is this like Tales from the Twilight World? Like there's, there's a lot of redlining here in terms of intensity and stuff like that. Um, again, like, you know, we've, we've gone through this band's catalog, my, my, favorite albums by them um the the three like the my my like top two are not especially aggressive so that isn't the side of them that i like the most but it's one thing that they can do well and they can do a lot of things well so i like the album overall i rate it six um i, I think at the edge of time is is better and then you know the 90s albums are the top four they're not really that you know like those are definitely the top four and then at the edge of time in this, I could argue either way. I like at the edge of I think the at the edge of time highlights like Valkyries is significantly better than anything on this album. Like I think that song is incredible. This album doesn't have an incredible song for me. It does have Deliver Us From Evil, which is not nearly as good as the one from Warlord, but we gotta deliver us from evil here. Um, it's enjoyable. Um, it's fine. Like I, I'd say like that, that one is hard to recall. Uh, and I saw like another podcast where you guys were talking about this and Alan mentioned that some of this album is hard. This is hard to recall or was for him at that time. That's, I think that's one of the main reasons why at the edge of time edges this thing out. In addition to having Valkyries, which is superior to anything on it is some of these outs. Like when I just, I'm looking at this title, I'm trying to like, what happens in that one? Um, but, but there, there's nothing bad on it. Um, Damnation is pretty good. The, the chorus this is definitely one of these songs where I'm waiting for the chorus and the chorus is strong. And then you get yeah. Secret to the American Gods, which I think is one of the three genuine Killer. on it. Like that, that is a highlight. And then the secrets of the American, American God. God. Yep. when he does that, when he does that bend on American, like I, I can't sing it, but when he does that bend on there, it's great. Um, that high shriek at the end, uh, you better save yourself. Like he does that little bend and it kind of chops out at the very end. That's the kind of stuff like he's doing some vamping. They're doing some call and answer and he's vamping. And that stuff I'd love for him to do far more often than he does. But you get it there. And I think that that, you know, like that, I think the damnation course is enjoyable. But this is this one's like, oh, this is really memorable and, and rich. Um, I'll just sort of a, a footnote on the production. The guitars obviously sound better. These drums and this isn't the chop on the guy. I'm sure he can play all this stuff perfectly. Uh, he's the drummer for Blind Guardian, but this just sounds like a quantized drum machine. There's no, there's. I'm not listening to this and thinking like you listen to Imagination from the other side. You hear there's a dude pounding, like that's yeah. a dude pounding. Yeah. I don't yeah. hear that at all here. Well, and there's a difference. That's the difference between uh, analog recording and digital recording. Yeah, there's there's room for it. Um, so I'm I, I, I so. The, the next song, Violent Shadows, and like maybe this is because like I'm an atheist from a Jewish family, but Sky Dancer, where is he in the reindeer procession? Is he near Blitzen? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, but it's it, like that that whole thing, the Sky Dancer, that whole that's it's enjoyable. Like this is this is this is solid stuff. Life Beyond the Spheres, probably probably Good the best song. Song album. Um, again, tapping into that sadder side, which is my favorite thing. The riffs are kind of puzzling in that. Like I'm hearing some riffs in there. I'm like, this this post chorus riff sounds a little bit like Tool. There's some kind of like whittling around, like harmonic um, kind of noise stuff. That's like this sounds a little bit different for them. Not necessarily good, but a little bit different. And maybe shit that they were exploring on um, Twist in the Myth that I just haven't spent that much time in. Um, uh, but you know, like so, let it be no more. That really good, lush, 
song, one of the other highlights. Really, that song for me on the album, love it. Again, tapping into, yeah, maybe that, maybe that one over Life Beyond the Spheres. Those are, it's yeah, kind they're of the, both, they're both vying for uh, yeah. superiority on that one for sure. As I say, like these dudes know the studio, they know what to do, and you listen to the arpeggio, the guitar at the beginning, and it just sounds so thin. It just sounds like this is like it doesn't sound like there was an amp um or it was like the frequencies were scooped in some way like this is a band that knows better that should be giving us really rich production at this point um and and again like different people do different things obviously there's a point there's a part in there's a point in um manila Rhodes' career where he's doing all this stuff at home and the, you know the productions of the albums after uh atlantis uh you know are like you know pretty shaky there's still some great music there oh yeah great music but shaky production this is like a polished album, and I don't know why it sounds like the like the guitar was just directly plugged in, and there was no amp, and there's zero body to the guitar. But "Let It Be No More" is really good. Um, "Blood uh, Blood of the Elves" I enjoy. Again, like I'm listening to this snare, and I'm like, maybe a human played it. I certainly wouldn't know from the sound. <laughs> I know because Blind Guardian is a top shelf power metal band that has top flight musicians. That's why I know, not because of anything I'm hearing. And then, um, uh, speaking of Disney, so you get the Destiny song with that frozen. So not a, like I think the album's weakest tracks are the opener and closer, not where you want to put the weakest tracks. Um, but not a bad song. And what the credit I'll give is this is this is another one of the kind of rare songs where the best idea is not a vocal rare Blind Guardian songs where the best idea is not a vocal idea, but it's that that six eight twin guitar melody that takes you out of the album was really quite good so that's like Ulbrich really had a um had a, had a nice spot there on an album that's you know like a lot of the album is basically waiting for the chorus with more energy and push than the previous one so it's a six again like now, now we've gone through the catalog They're, they have 12 albums six of them i think are good three of them i think are just barely above average and three of them i think are average so that that's kind of that's kind of where they settle. All right, Alan, now is your time to chime in. Have you spent more time with God Machine? Yes, yes, I have, Marty. <laughs> and it's dropped drastically for you. <laughs> no, it uh, it's maybe gone up a little bit. It has not made quantum leaps uh, uh, up this scale, though. I've got it ranked eighth. Um, okay. There are things I like about it. There are things I don't like about it. Um, but you look at the albums that it's edging out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's not a real fucking. Oh, I, I, only, I only ranked it A. That's not a singing praise, my friend. No, true. I mean, but yeah, at the same time, I mean, I the albums right ahead of it are "Follow the Blind," "At the Edge of Time," "Battalions of Fear." So it, it's you know it's got stiff competition ahead of it. Um. So it's got to, yeah, there's got to be some album that kind of falls there in the middle. And this is kind of it. It very much is the album they needed to make. Uh, you know, it, it, they did, they really did need to go back and prove they're tough on this one. It's, it's been a fun joke for the night, but this was a time where they had to do it. Yeah. Um, right. It had been, you know, literally decades at this point since they'd made anything heavy or aggressive as the main focus. And especially after the previous two albums, it's like, okay, I, there's a large segment of the fan base at this point that is wondering if you have any balls left to your songwriting or not. And if you don't, that's okay. You've given us a lot of great music. We can enjoy the old stuff. And you can go write the soundtrack to Frozen 3, Olaf Needs a New Nose. Uh, that's okay. But in terms of yes kind of you know reproving their metal as a heavy outfit this was the album they needed to do and it delivers on that point um they rein in those you know symphonic tendencies quite a bit and they let the aggression take front and center so good for them there's some good songs on here there are ones that i like um Let's take a look at the track list again. Deliver Us From Evil is a good opener. Uh, Damnation's pretty good. That one's based on the King Killer. Um, I don't know if that's just an anime series or a manga or what, but they're doing something that they have historically done well. They're diving into you know some sci-fi and fantasy stuff and finding inspiration for a song. Those usually turn out well for Blind Guardian. 
Uh, same with um, you know American Gods. They're pulling from you know the Neil Gaiman novel, and that's good source material. And that's a really really good song here on the album. After that, it starts getting a little more hit or miss. Violent Shadows uh, kind of goes in one ear out the other for me. I do like Life Beyond the Spheres. That one's got you know uh, a cool structure to it. Architect of Doom. I, someday that song will register, and I will know what it sounds like. But it's just always. It's like when you get abducted by aliens and there's like, you know, a six minute and 21 second gap in your memory and you can't remember what the hell happened, but you wake up feeling unpleasant. And you that's how I at the end of yeah, Architects your, of Doom. Your butthole just, stretched out? Yeah. Um, uh, amazingly, like when I did my rundown, it was the one song missing from my rundown. So apparently <laughs> also a gap in my memory as well. <laughs> they probed you too, Craig. Oh, no. <laughs> I have missing time. It must have been an alien abduction. Um, yeah. <laughs> That song is okay. It's I have this. I I I concur. I concur, and and apparently so does my left hand when I was writing this stuff down. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then uh, you know, let it be no more. That's a really really good song. It may be the best on the album. Um, one thing it harkens back to some of the you know great songs they've done in the past. It harkens back a little bit to Lord of the Rings and especially to Curse My Name from At the Edge of Time. You know, to the Bard songs. Uh, it works really good in that vein. Um, Blood of the Elves is a good one. Uh, you know, it's one of the heavier, more aggressive ones. I'm guessing it's got some kind of fantasy trilogy underpinning it too, but I'm not sure. I haven't spent enough time with the lyrics to suss out which one. And Destiny, Destiny doesn't really. It kind of clunks a little bit as a closer for me. So the track list they're not is great at, they're not great at closing songs i mean they've had success over the years but sometimes they a nail a lot it. of swings and misses yep, yep. yep. the last candle is i think the best they ever landed with the like, last candle was great uh and the story ends i think was great uh way to wrap the album up for that one but uh now so you know there yeah i've said nice things about the album <laughs> that said, I do still have some reservations about the album. I think that they put a lot of focus on the aggression, but they maybe didn't put enough thought into the aggression sometimes. They're like, it, like you said, Craig, they're going to prove her tough because we're just going, chug, 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 chug. There, we can do it. Fuck you. What'd you just do? Well, we chug, 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 chugged. Right. That's heavy, <laughs> right? Yeah, it is. Um, could you? I hate to nitpick, but could you maybe mix it up a little bit more? Uh, there's a lot of times where these songs feel like they're structured very similar to one another. There's a whole bunch of the songs that kind of start with a quiet, spoken or semi-sung interlude. And then it gets loud real fast, and we're going to chug. And the we'll get to the chorus, and Hansi's going to sing a line. And then the amorphous group of backing people are going to answer like we're in some kind of, you know, Greek tragedy. And those choruses, those are not things that, um, I'll be interested to see how this works live. I, I can't see these songs working with, you know, thousands of fans chanting along to those choruses the way you do to a big chunk of their classic set list. The song, the chorus isn't structured for that. Um, it's structured to just let Hansi sing a line and they sing a line. And the whole time, like you say, Craig, the drums just kind of keep going very mechanically. And, you know, the riff plays. Now, when they do the solos, the solos, the soloing here is excellent. Um, you know, Ulbricht's yeah, doing some great solo work. But, um, yeah, there's the songs feel a bit interchangeable at times. There are issues with the production. And it's really weird. Charlie Baufiend, the guy's been around forever. He's produced a million power metal albums and it always feels like he's a very inconsistent producer. I mean, he's worked with you know, a name. lot of, what are hmm? his, I know that name. What are his more famous things? Uh, that leaps to mind? A ton of the blind guardian catalog. He's done a ton of Halloween Saxon, uh, okay. Axel Rudy Pell, um, a couple of, a couple of running wilds. Not a lot of theirs. One of the Did demon wizards. I don't know big chunk of gamma ray i mean he he's one of the kind of go-to guys uh chunks of hammerfall halford heaven's gate yeah you know he's kind of you know, one of the go-to guys when it comes to you know german power metal and traditional metal stuff but he, but he's always been kind of hit or miss there are some albums where it's like yeah this album sounds excellent there are other albums he produces and you feel like 
who did this? Oh, wait, this guy's... Okay, it wasn't some random schmuck nobody ever heard of. This is a named producer, huh? Color me surprised. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, I'm surprised the album doesn't sound better with him behind the board, but at the same time, I'm not, because he, he's just not... Uh, you're still, not the only one i've heard like friends around here that say they really love the album but the mix is really kind of fucked would if the mix was more in line do you think these songs wouldn't wouldn't have been as um offensive at times to you i, I don't know maybe with the different mix that yeah the uh you know the sameness you know having you know, you know the riffs you know the just you know uh kind of you know soldier on in kind of the same fashion maybe your different elements would come out and it would sound like it mixes up a bit don't know uh yeah. maybe we'll find out someday i mean I, I agree i agree with a lot of uh, with a lot of what you're saying about the fact but this is something i think is a criticism i have for the band like actually from the beginning is at fast speeds they're not writing great riffs they're writing stuff that maintains the tempo mm. like that's like like yeah Ty Hansen is doing better riffs at that. If you're going at a double time thing, you're getting more interesting stuff from the Halloween guys and from Kai. Uh, then a, a lot of it feels like he's a guy, you know, like he's doing this so that he can lay over all of his, um, you know, Brian May style lead guitar. Like it's a bed for that stuff. But I don't even in the classic albums. I don't think that there are a lot of great riffs in the fat songs, um, but it was, uh, yeah. But I, I so I like, it could be, I think it could be better mixed, but when you're talking about some of that stuff seeming like autopilot, slam, 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 I think that's just kind of a lot of the riffs they wrote for the fast parts and the aggressive parts. I don't know that that would be different if it were mixed differently. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not convinced it would be. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a good point, Craig. And it, it does kind of, if it does feel that way here, that yes, they are, they're very focused on maintaining that aggression, that speed. And it seems to have come at the cost of making the songs a little more unique from one another a little more distinct that they they almost maybe reined in their you know tendency to include lots of stuff maybe too much maybe it needed a little more ornamentation here and there right. but um again they needed to rein that in for this album they many fans really needed to hear them just you know yeah pick it up and start blazing a bit and they did deliver on that so I still, I would give at the end of the day, I give the album a thumbs up. It's an enjoyable enough listen. It did what it needed to do. Uh, it delivered on its promises. Uh, I, I don't think it's quite as good as some people have hyped it to be. It, the The fact that it's fast and aggressive isn't enough to make it, you know, a, an album of the year, all time classic in the catalog contender, it, or at least not for me. I, I want a little bit more from Blind Guardian than that. Yeah. But Marty, I know you like it a bit more than I do, so I'm going to shut up and let you uh, let you uh, give it uh, some positivity here to wrap things up. Um, I'm going to take the approach of this album like I took the approach with the Rings of Power series on Prime. Um, people are pissed <laughs> off at that show, and I went into this show with no preconceived notions. First couple episodes, it takes a minute to, you know, get accustomed to the characters and know who's who and maybe some dry acting up against all the green screens, you know, kind of like the, the Star Wars prequel problem. But I end up really enjoying the, the show because I wasn't going in holding the, the, the creator's hand to the flame for, you know, complete, perfect adhering to the Tolkien mythos. I'm kind of taking this album the same way. I had no preconceived notions going in on this record honestly i didn't care i said you know what it's new blind art guardian album i'm gonna get it i'm gonna check it out and yes i mean this is number five in the in the list for me this comes after this should have been the follow-up to uh at the edge of time it sounds like the perfect lineup to that you could have shit canned the other two beyond the red mirror legacy of the dark lands this was a proper follow-up mix is a little weird the songs go from great to good enough, and I'm fine with that. Great to good enough is okay with me um, because, again, Blind Guardian sits at a standard a lot higher than a lot of other bands in the, in a same, in the same genre. Um, for me, Let It Be No More is, is the song on here. I mean, I didn't need the aggression on here. I know why they're doing it. 
unsurprisingly a grand unsurprisingly a grand six eight yeah a grand six eight but it isn't the six eight that gets me it's the atypical chorus hansi yeah. does something different with his his uh uh the way he takes the chorus the melody in the chorus it's different and it's so passionate and powerful and dark it's kind of a dark mournful song Mm -hmm. And I, I really connect to that. And I do love Delivers from Evil. It's a good start. Again, I can see Alan's, they're kind of playing it safe with the call and response. So Hansi lays down a line and the amorphous blob re, re, recall, you know, you, you call into the void, the void calls back into you type of shit. Um, Secrets of the American Gods. I like the feel in the chorus. Again, Hansi takes the melody in an unexpected turn and it's kind of a, soulful turn in that chorus uh life beyond the spheres another solid one not necessarily a super creative chorus it's just a good song um i've got no songs on here that bother me and is it their best i mean i put it five it's almost the middle of their catalog for me um i'm not gonna hate on it they've done better yes they have but let's be honest a band that's been putting out pretty high caliber album since 1988 i mean even their worst album legacy of the dark lands it's still good it, it is hard it, is it terrible it's not fucking terrible could i sit down and write a symphony i couldn't write a fucking symphony so for me to you know fat fuck from northern michigan sit there and go, you know i mean i slammed on the i slammed on the record but could i do it no <laughs> but um i um not a band that's a band every band that's been going this long is not going to put out the level of quality this band has and for you know all these years on in 2022 putting out an album with some fire in their bellies there's some fire in the, in these riffs um calling back to their you know, their early days which is great is it their best it isn't but it's solid and that's uh, i'm gonna leave it at that it's a solid five for me yeah I, I, what i'll be curious what i'll be curious to see is the next one, because I remember when Surgical Steel came out, and that was, I think, sort of a similar position um, over a much longer gap. And, and yeah. I, I liked, I like probably two thirds of Swan Song. So for me, it wasn't like they needed to be redeemed. Certainly, yeah, I need to be redeemed. <laughs> I, think, I think that album was a dramatic step down from the two before, which I think are like the two best death metal albums ever recorded. Yeah. Um. So it is a gigantic step down from those. And they needed redemption in terms of a qualitative thing, but I think when that album came out, it was like they're 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 showing it and they're they're proving it. But then the new album or the most recent one, Torn Artists, I think is terrific and much more creative and had some of that, but also has like that flesh ripping Sonic Torment song, which is like their creativity at its peak. So what I'm curious to see is now that Blind Guardian has given people the most speed metal album they've released since uh tales from the twilight world like now that they've given us this and they've proven that they can do it what's what's going to follow up and i hope it's you know like obviously i hope it's imaginations from the other side where they keep some of his edge but then like do that stuff because that you know like with like with the song valkyries which i i adore like i i've seen one time this millennium that they could hit that sort of peak uh but there are a bunch of other songs on at the edge of time that i that i really enjoy and and uh, on, on the new album as well. But I think, I don't know how how honest it is if you are delivering the album or how just true to yourself it is. If you're delivering the album, it's like, oh, this is what the fans want or people really hated the last one, which I think was what they wanted to do or Hansi wanted to do. I don't think mm. that orchestral thing is like, this is the fans are clamoring for this nonsense. <laughs> so they the did. They're going to love it. <laughs> terribly. And so now they've done what I think people want and they're getting a lot of acclaim and I wish them all, all the success. And I like the album for sure. It's right in the middle for me for the catalog. I have it as six. Um, but I hope it leads to them exploring what they want to explore and having them use and doing stuff that they enjoy as, as much. Because I've got to say that like outside of At the Edge of Time, um, for me, there's an easy best Hansi Kirsch album of this millennium and it's this third demon that movie. album is a long but it was a grower for me but when it clicked i really liked it I thought there was some, so there was a couple songs that brought me to tears there was it's like extremely it's extremely moving i mean you can listen to the blind guardian and you don't get the treason of listening to demons <laughs> <laughs> 
So there's that. There's that Sands the rebel flags. Yeah, you don't get the treason, but I, like, there's a, like imagine the, the the title cut from Imaginations from the other side to me sounds like like that song. This entire album sounds like this. That song. It's not as good, but I the heaviness of this, um, the heaviness of this thing. Uh, I just I just really like. So I was hopeful going into the new Blind Guardian because I was like, oh wow. That's the like when that Themes and Wizards third album came out, like that's the best thing Hansi's done um, since Nightfall. Uh, and then, you know, and then we, we got the new one. So I think he's a bit of a, like for me, it's two in a row of him doing more consistent things. But, uh, anyways, I look forward to the next one and I hope it's, I hope it goes the way of torn arteries, which is like we've proven this stuff and now we're going to do what creatively speaks to us at the, mo the, the, the most, uh, which I don't know that this new album, uh, God Machine, is. I think this is like, we can do this really well because we're we're really talented and we've done it before. I do want to go back to James Warrior's uh, question here. So the argument is, is it too simplistic? I wouldn't say it's simplistic. You know, maybe in the in the if if you pit it up against the best, most bombastic, grandiose Blind Guardian albums, it is a little bit more simplistic. But it's them sticking to their formula. But um, you know giving a little nod of appreciation to their speed metal years, but I think the songs are a lot more cohesive than their speed metal years. You could tell they've got decades of progression and, um, um, bonding with their instruments. It's just, they know what they're doing at this point. Is it a groundbreaking album? It is not. It is just another blind guardian album, but it's some solid songwriting. Is it all solid songwriting? No, there's better songs than others, but the good songs are really stand out to me. I mean, the, 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 like that, let it be no more song is a good song in their cattle, in their entire cattle. It hangs in there with, you know, some of their best. I, I love, I love some elements of that song is the whole album that quality. It is not, but at this point in blind guardians career, it's, it's good enough. Again, it's good enough. You know, does anybody have anything to add to that? I mean, I'm 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 with you on that. I think in general, um, I mean, the new album, the new album is, is is simpler, and I don't think. But it's the thing is, if you look at a song like Lord of the Rings, that thing works because the core ideas are great, and this new album has a lot more layers than, say, like you know the original like speed metal era albums. Yeah. And it's going to come down to the the core ideas. I think something that's lost is because of this like kind of compressed thing and the drum sounding like drum machines i mean like 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 tom and stouch delivered a lot of personality like you listen to mirror mirror and all the beats flipping around and all over imaginations from the other side like that aspect is gone and since i think a lot of the riffing particularly in the fast stuff but blind guardian is kind of like setting momentum and doing this and putting down a bed yeah. for brian for brian may style leads if the drums sound like a drum machine you've lost something and the drums on imagination from the other side again like to me uh, like like third behind those two Lost Horizon albums in terms of tremendous drum performance, elevating you know great songs to the to the masterful stratosphere. So I think that that's some of it. I don't think that like I'm not I don't like, there was not a drumming moment that stood out on this. Whereas yeah. I'm at, from the other side, they're probably they're probably four to five in each song. So it's a different. So they've lost. That's something that they've really lost. Well, Hansi, Hansi has become the focal point to their music. It's it's kind yeah, of it's obvious. Really it. It's an album where I'm waiting for the choruses. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also interested uh, to see what they do next or where they want to go from here. Um, yeah. It, I think Blind Guardian is far enough in their career. They didn't have to do this album just to placate fans if they didn't really want to. Um, but is it something they're going to want to stick Stick to I that I don't know. They, they've been inconsistent for the yeah. past couple of decades. They they've kind of drifted back and forth um, on the spectrum, and I honestly don't know where they'll go. I mean, right now, let's also be honest. Right now is a time frame for bands where it's a good idea financially to do the you know go back and do something you know old school. You know, we've seen a lot of artists kind of have that return to form because metal is very popular right now, but it's also popular through kind of a nostalgic lens. People want to hear Judas Priest play something like they used to. So, okay, here's firepower. We, we, we don't want to hear Dave Mustaine, you know, uh, just all over the place again. Okay. You know, let's, let's get a Megadeth album. That sounds more like a classic Megadeth. And 
yeah, it's kind of easy maybe for Blind Guardian to think, okay, well, yeah, we uh, we can follow that along too. And he- here's something that sounds like a classic Blind Guardian album to feed that heavy metal nostalgia machine that's been going pretty hard the past yep. few years. Does that die down in another couple of years? Do, do these bands feel like, okay, you, you got your one, and now we will wander back off and do the soundtrack to Frozen Part 4, Blood Upon the Ice. Things are ugly between Alpha and Olaf. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's very hard to predict where they go. I've been thrown for a loop too many times in the past 20 years trying to figure out what Blind Guardian is going to do next, so for one, I'm just not going to worry about it when... We'll wait five years. They'll come out with another album. I'll I'll check it out. I'm sure, but um, I'm going to try to you know just keep very level. I've learned with this band in particular, and it's a good idea for all bands, but Blind Guardian in particular, not not a good idea to build up any expectations one way or the other because you don't quite know what they're going to do next. On one hand, it can keep it interesting, but there are some things I think this band does better than others, and so uh, yeah. When they go too overboard with you know the, the symphonic elements, they just lose me, and that's not uh, even if the expectations are level, that's not really going to chive with me. But it may be where they want to go, and they can do what they want. Absolutely. We shall see. Uh, uh, I, I will follow them blindly. I guess we'll, we'll end with a. a <laughs> <laughs> well with yeah. that people yeah. everybody in the chat give uh alan a big salute because he's up late on a school night cheers to you brother for sticking it out and um Thanks. Thanks. it's been fun it's been fun it's been not a great uh day or evening but uh th- th- this was a fun way to wrap things up awesome so, but and before this was not a fun evening is what i was trying to convey there if i wasn't uh, clear. sorry man i did one of those days and Craig, we're so thankful to finally get you on. Um, it was a lot of fun. Yes, great time great having you on board. Yeah, I th- thank you. I, I, as I said, I'm a huge fan of the show, and you know, throughout some of my arduous work days, uh, you guys have kept me company. And although you know Marty's a dear friend, I've known him for a long time, and you know Alan, Alan, I, like I, you know, like thank you for for the content. Uh, certainly, if you're ever in New York, you better reach out to me. Um, I think we would hang out and have plenty to chat about. <laughs> and um uh yeah I, i've wanted i've wanted to come on and, and glad you could make time i know wednesday isn't ideal and if uh you you obviously see i i I'm, i mean i'm never lacking for opinions so um i uh yeah like you know they're blue oyster cult or carcass or morbid angel or metallica i'm, I'm you know i'm you know where, wherever what wh- wh- whatever you want to do but if the wednesday needs to be shorter it can be shorter and just be an album. You just do one album. Well, yeah. uh, definitely penciling in for the Blue Oyster Cult. I know uh, Jeff at Metal Madness 66 is doing a Blue Oyster Cult dive this weekend. So go check that out. But right. um, we're going to get Craig and I think Aaron, the Metal Theologian, on at the same time and go at it with the Blue Oyster Cult. And, of course, other things as well. I mean, you're, you have an open invite anytime you want. Uh, we'll figure it out. Um, we'll make it work. Yeah. Yep, and as far as programming notes, people, before we cut here, uh, tomorrow night we'll be back. Um, the Album Club, we're going to be discussing uh, St. Vitus's Die Healing. Friday night, um, we'll be back with another episode of Heavy Metallurgy with Darcy from Six Strings, Nine Lives. We'll be discussing our favorite releases from the year 1989. So, yeah, we crammed in a lot of shit this week for you folks. We, we, I took a week, we took a week off, and now we're trying to trying to make it up to all y'all but um um if there's anybody in the chat that has any questions for craig now would be the time um granted we're going to have him on again but uh if you have any movie questions yeah, I, or book questions alan up any later than, than than we already have so either he can he can sign out or we can just do this another time i'll be on again i mean this is this is fun right on. And, and and i you know i had concerns that i would mess it up on a technical level because i'm not especially good with computers but it landed. You see me. I'm a human being. I have all these albums. I have all of all of those albums. <laughs> so, yep. uh, yeah, we uh, we we can we can we can cut it. We don't need. I I, I don't want to keep. Uh, I don't want to keep Alan up. Right on. Well, um, Craig, don't hang up. Uh, we're gonna bail. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, soundtracks episode. I have zero soundtracks, so I would be. Uh, 
twiddling my thumbs during that session for sure. I would have probably 15 goblin things to contribute to that and some, <laughs> and some killer, um, uh, and some Fabio Fritz. I would have a lot of Italian stuff to discuss. I got to say laps nine continuum. It is inspiring what Craig has done and I've known him before he started, he jumped into the, the side of his career that he has. And I have never known a man that's more driven or creative and endless, endless ideas in this guy, endlessly driven. It's inspiring. I wish, I wish I could uh, buy a can of what he's selling. <laughs> yeah. Well, metal is the fuel. And right. <laughs> since I was a teenager. So metal is the fuel. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow night with uh, Kellen and Jim. We'll be talking about St. Vitus and Craig again. Thank you so much. Don't hang up. Uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you all for watching. It was a good Wednesday. Take care. See you soon. I'm too tired to come up with a chicken joke. So everybody gets a pass tonight. <laughs>